I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome. It's good to hear the pledge being said this way, because usually we just hear ourselves suck. So thank you for participating in the Pledge of Allegiance with us. Um, we are going to welcome everybody. We're going to get started with our board meeting. But as a reminder, if you want to participate in the unscheduled audience participation, um, at, at the uh, desk over there underneath the flags, there's, uh, there's a card. Fill out that card and hand it to Angela. Angela is right here at the end of the table. And um, that will give you that, uh, and she'll pass those over to us and allow you to participate in an um, unscheduled audience participation. Erin, will you take attendance, please? I will. President D'Alessandro? Here. Vice President Schaefer? Here. Secretary Reese? Here. Treasurer Hanser? Present. Trustee McDonough? Here. Trustee Summers? Here. Trustee Whitney? Here. Thank you. Uh, there are no changes to the board agenda. So that'll bring us to item number three, our school presentations, um, which I think most of you are here for. Um, so the student arts, athletics, and academic recognition is item A. We're going to be very excited about recognizing a number of students from each of our buildings. And I believe that if we're getting the signals crossed, they should be entering shortly. If not, um, would somebody yell across the hall that we're ready <laughs> and waiting? That would be good. One more announcement while we're waiting. Those of you who are holding an agenda in your hand, notice that item seven is missing. Uh, the copier just spit it out before it printed number seven. We're not sure how that happened, right, Angela? But it's okay. Yeah. Um, so when we get to that item on the agenda, we're going to be printing number seven on the screen so that you'll be able to see the full agenda. So, do we have students and, and here they come. Ah, good. Use that word being, uh, there they are, yep. All right, good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good evening. My name is Stephanie Neme, and I am the principal at Clear Lake Elementary. I'm super excited to kick us off this evening. Um, I have two students that have been nominated at Clear Lake, and we're going to actually start with Olive Squires. She is a fourth grader at Clear Lake, and Olive was nominated. All of our students were entered by their teachers for living the Ivy Learner profile, and Miss Olive was recommended by her teacher because she said, um, Olive really exhibits the Ivy Learner profile of being a risk taker, and she said that this entire school year, she has been a risk taker with her learning and really pushing herself to do her best um, at school. So that is Miss Olive. Um, my second student, oh, yep. And our second student this evening is um, unfortunately not here, but I'm gonna recognize Charlize McFarland. She is also a fourth grader at Clear Lake. And Charlize was nominated for being on the Ivy Learner profile of Knowledgeable. Um, Charlize has really come along in her understanding of math, and she's actually been um, running some small group math groups um, for her teacher. And um, her student, her peers have been very supported by her, um, and that we've seen um, Charlize's confidence in math just grow this year along with her knowledge. So we recognize her. All right, thank you for having me this evening. I'm Chad Boyd, the principal at Daniel Axford Elementary. Um, 
Tonight, we'd like to recognize four students at Daniel Axford for being open-minded and caring. These students go above and beyond to help their classmates. They are all great examples of living our school mission as caring, contributing members of a global society. Those students are? Easton Jones. Come on up. Okay, good evening everybody. I'm actually Anita Conja Collins. I'm Assistant Superintendent of Elementary Instruction. I'm standing in today for Mrs. Glynn, Principal of Lakeville, who could not be here tonight. So I'm actually going to have all of our Lakeville friends, if you want to all come forward so you can get like a long time in the limelight. <laughs> <laughs> yep, come on up, all my Lakeville friends. Uh -oh, come down there for yep, keep going. This is a... Everybody Don't they look so nice? They all dressed up for the occasion. I love it. Even some new shoes, I was told. So um, Lakeville chose to acknowledge students who best exemplify the IB Learner profile as well. The specials teachers, our art, music, Spanish, PE teachers, all um, work with all Lakeville students and they collaborated to select the following students. For being principal, Clara Umscheid, Open-minded, Emery Ulin. Caring, Ezra Davidson. Communicator, John Pedroso. For being a risk taker, Michaela Daya. Thinker. Abby Duncan, Inquirer, Marley Tyson, Balance, Deanna Bartnick, for being knowledgeable, Aubrey Allen, and for being reflective, Scott Lewiston. Hi, I'm Paul McDevitt. I'm the principal at Leonard Elementary School, and I'm proud to present to you um, our six safety patrol captains for this year. Um, the Leonard Elementary Safety Patrol is made up of fifth grade students. This year we had the biggest group of students that we've ever had in the history of Leonard um, on our safety patrol with a total of 44 students. Um, <clears throat> some of the jobs of the safety patrol include uh, doing the crosswalks in front of the buses, uh, greeting staff and students, putting the flag up and bringing it down and folding it correctly at the end of the day, mentoring future safety patrollers, helping load the buses, hall monitors, working on our bulletin boards and much more. These six students we're honoring tonight have been or currently are our safety patrol captains. We have a morning captain and an afternoon captain. All students in fifth grade must apply to be on the safety patrol. Each application requires a essay to be written on why they think they would make a good safety. The first two captains of the year are selected based on their essays. Once they get started, the rest of the captains are selected throughout the year for their commitment and going above and beyond. The captain's job is to oversee the rest of the safety patrol. Any problems are brought to their attention. They make sure everyone is at their posts and of course wearing their safety belt. If there's a need for a substitute, 
they will assign a person to that job or they will do it themselves. These six students here tonight have shown great leadership and we are very proud of each and every one of them. First we have Halen Carter. <laughs> Johnny Cook. <laughs> Luciana Miranda. <laughs> Emma Novak. Riley Parker, Liliana Schaefer, and of course this couldn't be done without our adult support and our safety patrol <laughs> person who runs our whole safety patrol does a fantastic job with that is Mrs. Melissa Musgrove. Thank you. Uh, good evening, thank you for having us today. Uh, my name is Jeff Brown, I'm the principal at Oxford Elementary School. Uh, one of the foundational pieces of the International Baccalaureate program is convincing kids to take action and the girls that are here with me tonight, completely by their own choice, partly because Allie is just super cute and motivates us all to do things. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Allie is our therapy dog that we have at OES that Jillian Jess Moore is uh, wonderfully housing. But the girls that are in front of us tonight raised over $1,600 in both cash and supplies for the Oxford Wildcat Pack. Um, in addition to taking that action, they helped motivate others in the school and they presented um, their action in a whole school assembly where they stood up in front of our whole student population of 375 and shared their actions with everybody else. And so we're both excited for their accomplishments and what they raised, but we're also very impressed that they were willing to come and share that with all of our students. And so girls, we thank you for that contribution. Uh, here are the students that were the key to this. Emma Hart, please come on over. <laughs> Madeline Smalley. <laughs> Alexis Mester. <laughs> Noelle DeVolder. <laughs> Stella Curry. <laughs> Kinsley Mills. Mariah, I'm not going to get it right. Mariah Gench. Wow, that's good. <laughs> and Isla Green. <laughs> Great job, girls. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Oh, we forgot somebody. Kennedy Wilson. Woo, Kennedy! Man. <laughs> Kennedy, I apologize. Kennedy Wilson. You can come to me. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Okay. Good job, Kenny. Well, you may have Thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, there it is. Right there. <laughs> Off the hook, Jeff. Good evening, everyone. My name is Brad Bigelow. I serve as the principal here at Oxford Middle School. I appreciate the opportunity to recognize some outstanding middle school students this evening and to honor them for their accomplishments. Um, in case you weren't aware, I have standing before you the Cyborg Cats, one of our middle school robotics teams. I'd like to provide you with just a, a brief overview of their season and what has brought us here tonight to do a little celebration. In both of their regular season qualifier competitions, the Cy Cyborg Cats made it to the semifinals and the elimination rounds. They were chosen to be, excuse me, 
On December 7th and 8th, 72 teams from across Michigan attended the Michigan State Robotics Championship. They were chosen to be part of the fourth alliance in elimination play. Their alliance beat the number one alliance in semifinals and then beat the number three alliance in the finals for the Woody Flowers division. This moved them to the interdivisional finals where they competed against the winner of the Murray Curry division. They won the best two out of three matches to become the State of Michigan Middle School State Champions. I, I know how hard this group of students works. Um, all of our robotics teams, in fact, we have a robotics room here in the middle school. Um, it's upstairs. They are here a lot. Um, I know the time, effort, and energy that they put in, as well as their coaches who stand up here as well. I'm extremely grateful for the program and what it brings, the opportunities it affords um, our students. So, outstanding job. So, members of the Cyborg Cats, we have Reese Boy. <laughs> Max Soper. Alison Grabowski, Karen Parkin, Dylan Miller, Caleb Horton, Connor Umshied, Andrew Prevo, and Gabe Whitney. Oh, I'm sorry, Evan, and it got stuck behind one. Evan Ruhlman. Um, my name is Aletha Van Luzen, and I have the privilege to be the principal at Oxford Bridges High School. Tonight, the two students that I'm honoring um, is Angel Montanez and Robert Nario. Neither, unfortunately, could be here tonight. They live about 40 minutes away, and just to come back up this way was a lot of expensive gas. <laughs> um, I want to acknowledge them for their focus on learning. Let me back up for their focus on earning and just their overall excellence um, in behavior and attitude at Oxford Bridges. When we speak about all the opportunities that our students have, I wanted to add one that we might not think about, which is the Technical Center, Oakland Schools Technical Center. Both uh, Robert and Angel attend there. Um, Angel attends the Construction Technology Program, and he has been nominated for the... <coughs> I'm sorry. Oh, I'm nervous. I'm going to take a deep breath. It's going to be longer than two minutes for some of those people that are timing me. <laughs> I'm kidding. Angel attends the construction technology program where he has been nominated for the National Technical Honors um, Society. His teacher says, Angel's work here is outstanding. He is a very industrious, productive, and courteous student. Robert also attends in the automotive technology program. He has currently passed nine out of the ten practice certifications and will begin his actual state search in the next week or so. These ASE certifications will make him a certified auto mechanic, which is recognized through the state of Michigan. His teacher said, you can tell this is Robert's thing. He has um, knocked it out of the park. Not many students do this well. Robert also has an opportunity for job placement in a dealership. So congratulations to my boys for that. Hello, my name is Jordan Dennis. I am the elementary assistant principal at Oxford Virtual Academy. Uh, tonight, we are here to look at that power stance. What a guy. Ryan Atkins over recognizes fifth grade student Ryan Atkins for his achievement in academics and his personal growth since coming to OVA this semester. Uh, adjusting to virtual school is a big challenge, and Ryan has taken off. Ryan has shown a strong aptitude for coding. 
Uh, he has been wonderful at music analysis, and he's even painted this month's mural at the Overlap. Uh, Ryan is creative, motivated, hardworking, and, and actively participates in lab activities. He loves to challenge anybody who comes to the lab in a game of basketball. Uh, he brings an exciting and positive uh, culture and passion to the school community. He's a great friend to others, and he just brings a just such a positive vibe. I mean, just look at him. <laughs> uh, others gravitate to him and love to learn about his latest ideas and interests. You can't help but smile when Ryan's around. Congratulations, <laughs> Ryan Atkins. <laughs> So good evening. My name is Janet Schall. I'm the principal of the Oxford Virtual Academy. Uh, my colleague um, Jordan Dennis jumped in he, uh, to recognize our elementary student, and we are a K-12 building, so that's why we have some kiddos probably out of grade order, but over the K-12 building. So we wanted to take, um, recognize both levels tonight. So for secondary, we're really excited tonight because OVA launched its first National Honor Society. Um, it's called the OVA Lighthouse Chapter of the National Honor Society, and attending tonight's Emily Cantu. Victoria Cantu, Richard Wilson, Lily Holyfield, Gracie Clemens, Ethan Garner, and Hadil Bazi. So, and, and just really quick, their accomplishments are pretty notable. They inducted our first members, they elected our first executive board, they started a tutoring um, program completely organized by members. They adopted two families at Christmas, and I know the work that went into it because I bought the wrapping paper and delivered the gifts with <laughs> Mr. Crane. And there were a lot of them, so it was pretty impressive for such a smaller group in, in the first chapter. They started snack carts at the Oval Lab as a fundraiser. It's going really well. We have soda and all these goodies, and um, it's, it's been a really great thing for their fundraising campaign. They conducted a bottle and can drive in the fall and are currently in the middle of another one. And they will be partnering with Oxford Open Handed um, going forward. So, congratulations to the certificates back there because they aren't all here. So. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you for starting that chapter. It's exciting. Our own honor society. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Daisha Beasley. I am the principal of Oxford High School, and I have a couple different groups for you this evening. First off, I am hopeful that many people in this room enjoyed our musical to share The Little Mermaid. And so, yay! <laughs> And while I could not bring every single person here who is involved in that great production, I wanted to bring you some representatives of all of the different areas that went into this musical. So on behalf of the actors, I have Mr. Xander Brown. Xander was Sebastian, if you remember. So Sebastian was supposed to be accompanied tonight by Ariel, but she is at work. So Miss Heidi <laughs> Allen um, and, and Xander really led as senior leadership in that acting group, um, did such a phenomenal job, and were such instrumental, obviously, players to that production. They could not do it, though, just by themselves on the stage. And so representing the pit orchestra tonight is Miss Allison Hepp. And Nora Chaffa also, I had asked her to come. She's playing softball for the Wildcats this evening and couldn't be here. But Nora and Allison represent the pit orchestra. Lots of work behind the scenes, under the scenes, to um, present just such beautiful music for our actors um, and our singers to, to accompany. So I want to thank you, Allison, on behalf of um, all of us for the work of you and your orchestra. Thank you. 
great. Aubrey Greenfield couldn't make it, but Aubrey is one of our seniors who was the stage manager, and she has put she has been behind that stage directing traffic for well all four years, I believe, and she has done such a great job. And so I didn't want to uh, have this evening go by without recognizing Aubrey and all of the work that she does. Uh, and then we couldn't hear the singers, or we wouldn't be able to hear the music without the help of our audio folks here. So Matthew Barkman and Josh Curtis represent some of the behind the scenes that go on. And I want to let you know that it's not just the musical that Matthew and Josh represent. They are have been behind the scenes of every performance, everything that goes on in the Performing Arts Center at our school. So if it's a musical concert by an elementary group, they're working on assemblies and things like that. So Matthew and Josh represent the behind the scenes work of our students as well. Thank you. So I want to continue with our arts group, if I could invite McKenna Weaver and Kaylee Wojcik up. So in the areas of the arts, it's not just um, our musicians and our theater um, and our dance, but it's also our, our visual arts. And so um, McKenna and Kaylee have spent a lot of time at our school in the arts department. In fact, they're both seniors and they're both going on to school to study art. Kaylee will be going to the creative, or the College for Creative Studies, CCS, and McKenna is going to Brigham Young University. And McKenna just won a regional gold key. If you know anything about art, that's a really big deal. And um, Kaylee has received over $100,000 in scholarship for CCS. So both of them have done a phenomenal job. Thank you. Next up, I have some athletes for you. So our winter athletes. We're going to first invite two out of the four all-state wrestlers and what you might notice and you might think is a little um, different like this is um, our first McKenna uh, Bovey and Cheyenne Frank are our first two girls to place in the state at the girls wrestling championships and um, Cheyenne is a freshman and she placed fifth place at Ford Field um, represented our Wildcats so well this year we're really proud of Cheyenne and McKenna McKenna was seventh place, and so all-state athlete, all-state wrestler Cheyenne. Yeah. And this is Cohen Everhart. He is a senior. He was a runner-up at the regional championships and also was eighth place in the state, going on to college and wrestle. And this evening, um, one of our freshmen, a seventh place all-state athlete, Gavin Lewis, he is playing baseball tonight for the Wildcats. So could not be here, but we're really proud of our winter wrestlers and our all-state athletes here. Congratulations. <laughs> Extremely proud of our swim team. They placed the highest ever in Oxford High School history this year at the Boys Division I Swimming and Diving Championships. They were 10th in the state class, Division I, a very, very big deal. And so tonight I have the medley relay team. Um, we have Olin Charnstrom, we have Chris Jasper, we have Jake Olheiser, and we also have, oh, Preston, Preston Mueller here. Those, they were 12th in the state, so second team all state. And Preston, wave your hand, Preston. Preston was also second team all state in the 100 fly. And Olin uh, was fourth place in the 100 freestyle. And drum roll, please. Someone. <laughs> Olin also was a state champion for us and our first ever state champion in the 100 backstroke. So, extremely proud of her. not just the swim team that we recognize um, in that winter sport, it's also diving. So swimming and diving, uh, it makes up one of the events, but couldn't be better represented, I don't think, in our diving competitions. Um, this is Liam Pearson. He was third this year. He comes back next year, as do um, Olin and just Olin and Chris Topher. Um, and Liam was third in diving and uh, did just such a great job. Record breakers all around here. Um, I wasn't one, I don't think there was one meet that I didn't come back on the announcements and say we had a record breaking performance. So just such a great job by our swim and dive team this year as well. Thank you. Uh, I should mention
mention that I could have picked any of these students to be to focus on their academics as well. Um, they are true student athletes and student artists. But um, tonight, representing the area of academics, I have Mr. Dylan Morris. Dylan is a senior. You may recognize him recently in the last year. He's been a very big part of No Future Without Today. Um, and yeah. Dylan started his leadership early on at uh, Lakeville Elementary and uh, honed his skills, I might say, at, here at Oxford Middle School, um, dabbling in leadership. But also, um, he is part of orchestra. He takes a AP and IB courses. Uh, Dylan is 99% sure? I think so. You yeah. think? Oh, yeah. well, he, he's going to Harvard. <laughs> so we're really, really proud of Dylan. Most recently, he spent his spring break not on the beach, not um, you know, in warm places, but he was actually on Capitol Hill and trying to working hard to introduce a new bill. So not a bad spring break for for Dylan Morris. So thank you, board, for recognizing me after high school. Can we give a shout out too to our coaches and our parents who support these great students too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have item B, which is um, Teacher of the Year and Support Person of the Year. Ryan? Good evening, board. It is my honor and pleasure to be here tonight to speak to you about our Teacher and Support Staff Persons of the Year. Every year, Oxford Community Schools participates in the Oakland County Outstanding Teacher of the Year Awards. This annual recognition is presented to Oakland County teachers and support staff members who have achieved, through their effort and example, the highest standards of excellence in their profession. Here at Oxford, each building nominates two candidates, one teacher and one support staff member, to be considered by our district administration before being submitted to Oakland schools for consideration at the county level. Oxford's district administration selects one teacher from the elementary level, one teacher from the secondary level, grades 6 through 12, and one support staff member. This year, three Oxford community staff members were selected to move on to represent our district at Oakland Schools. And as I call your name, if you would please join me. At the elementary level, from da Daniel Axford Elementary, first grade teacher, Jessica Bull. <laughs> Level, Oxford High School Career and Technical Education teacher, Craig Trombley. <laughs> and as our support staff representative, Leonard paraprofessional, Amanda Sampson. <laughs> I would also like to introduce to you this evening a longtime supporter of Oxford Community Schools, Mr. Wayne Haney of um, Haney Farm Bureau Agency. Mr. Heaney, thank you for your support and generosity. My Stay pleasure. Forward. I promised her I would keep it short. I promise. <laughs> so, um, my name is Wayne. I'm the local FBI agent, otherwise known as Farm Bureau Insurance. And <laughs> once a year, um, my team lets me out 
and I get to do this, which is a huge joy. And um, I can't believe it. Six years ago, I retired as a teacher from Mott and North Branch, and I always swore that if um, I was able to get my business up and running, that one of the things I wanted to do first was to give back. And by my count, I think we've given away over sixteen thousand dollars to these kinds of programs. And the young people who we just saw, they're a testament and a testimony to what you folks are doing. So kudos to you, and I am just super grateful and honored to be able to add a small bit of something, something. The only thing, look, you don't need me to lecture to you. The one thing I'm gonna say is I know teachers and I know, I know staff. This, this is for you to do something nice for you. So thank you so much for your service. Congratulations to all staff nominated at our buildings and to these three finalists. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Suckley, we have Oxford Gives Back presentation. We do. So um, I am Mark Suckley. I am the director of early college. And really, uh, for Oxford Gives Back, I am the support person uh, for the team. And so we have with us uh, Laura Merritt, who is the mentor advisor for the past six, seven years uh, for basically our student leadership team for Oxford Gives Back. And so I have Adias here as well. And so I am passing the mic because I'm just the support person. Uh, good evening, my name is Laura Merritt and I am the teacher that works with our student planning committee for Oxford Gives Back. So we just wanted to provide you with a kind of a brief update tonight of where we are and how this year's cleanup is looking. Um, I'm going to have Addie speak in a minute. Um, I threw her, you know, today I was like, you're going to do this tonight. So she's a little nervous, but it's going to be okay. Um, so this is our seventh annual cleanup. Um, we're really excited the students do this all on their own. I am there to help them and guide them, but this is a 100% student driven project. Uh, and we clean lawns for elderly homeowners in the community, and it's this really amazing community service project that students lead every year. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Addie, and she's going to give you a brief update of where we are with the cleanup. Hi, my name is Addie, and I'm one of the students on the planning team this year. And this year we have 43 homes that we're going to be cleaning. And from local sponsors, we got six people to sponsor our event. And our event is on April 22nd and 23rd, and we still need lots of volunteers. And we have these flyers if anyone is looking to sign up. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to make a little bit of a change and we're going to have the loft presentation. Uh, we're going to move it from item 7B to current. Does that sound good, Pam? Yeah, that's great. All right, Pam Beal. Actually, I'm going to welcome up some of my most favorite people in the world. I'm going to um, Miss Jeannie DeSico, the pair of pros that work in that classroom, and uh, most importantly, our 18 to 26 year old students. So, can you guys join me up here, please?
So while he does that, um, just, just to introduce them, they're the ones that are going to give you this presentation, but much like se several groups that have been up here this year already, um, our LOFT program at the end of the year, previous, prior to COVID, um, did go on an overnight trip celebrating a lot of the independent living skills and employment skills that they learned throughout the year. So we do need board approval for them to go on that overnight trip again. So they are going to present to you um, something that they put together in hopes that the next boarding meeting <coughs> will approve. Um, but honestly, I just want to take a brief, I know where time is, um, uh, time is, <laughs> Okay. You have much time in, you just go. Okay, well, so these students here are, um, sorry, I'm sorry. Um, if, we're on, if we're doing recognition of academics, their academics are, like I said, independent skills, living skills, and employment skills, and um, so I would like to take this opportunity to recognize our LOFT program, and Ms. Ms. DeSico, and you guys who have, um, done a lot within the community, which they're gonna highlight tonight, but one thing that I really wanted to give them a shout out for is they have started their own catering business. And I don't know if you knew this or not, but Oakland Schools campus um, down in Waterford, um, after COVID, they shut down their cafeteria. And they have been contracting our loft students to cater various events and conferences at Oakland Schools. So I just want to recognize them for their hard work with them. Okay, and with that, um, several of them are very nervous, but um, they're going to come up here and do their presentation for you. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. That was very emotional. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for having us. And we are going to start because I know it's time is of essence here. But I put the, we put this together, but I didn't do this by myself. You need to know. Oh, you guys can. I'm just very Thank short. You. Okay. <laughs> my students and I and my staff all helped put this together. So I, they do kind of want to highlight some of the things that we do. But I need to tell you that when we did go away before, we went to Chicago. Yes. We're just asking to go to Port Austin. <laughs> so if I could take them all on a train, I wish I could show some of those videos. But um, I just want to start, and I can go like this, by saying, one of, and Bert, she's going to talk about this, but one of the things that, and I'm going to have a slide on this, that I pride in is that these students that I have, I have for eight years. And when they leave the law program, they are ready to hit this community, ready and rolling. And we have a lot of community helpers. We're doing expert open-handed now, so we are the ones that are helping there. We love that. And this whole catering thing. So I just want to thank Oxford for just knowing us and putting our name out there and letting us do these things. So with that being said, I'm going to start, let them start. Darian Grace. Hi. Hi. Hey. So the first slide is what is LOFT about? So part of the gr growth in our inter independence includes daily living skills, cooking, shopping, Pays Lab, uh, sensory lab, exercise, meditation, Yoda, or yoga, sorry. <laughs> I read it the same way. <laughs> and um, current events, um, budgeting, circles, tribes, and people smart skills. And outside, um, that one. Oh, outside agency support services yeah. like MRS, CLS, all the things that we need to be independent once we leave the law program. And <laughs> what is the loft? The loft program consists of young adults with cognitive disabilities from age 18 to 26. In this adult transition program, we learn how to become independent, community awareness is a big part of pro of the program. This is some examples of what we do. Uh, catering for, for Oakland schools, how to be on the job, help in the community, fish pantry, evergreens, um, Oxford open-handed, um, sorting Legos, 
uh, organizing and sorting clothes at the Oxford Open Handed Clothes Closet. Daily living skills will be practice, community awareness, job recognize, readiness skills for independence. Evergreens Coffee Shop, Oxford DDA, Oxford Downtown Development Authority, <laughs> doing um, designing. No. I know, but I, <laughs> decorating, I am not a big decorator, so I suck at when that <laughs> comes up, I'm just saying. Um, bagging items for events and gardening downtown. All right, why are we presenting to the board tonight? Good question. <laughs> Um, we are hoping that you approve for us to go to Port Austin, Michigan. We can have this beautiful 10,000 square foot schoolhouse that's turned into actually a man mansion. It is a VRBO and it's a great price, $375 per night. And the, the gentleman that owns this is an educator. I just thought it. <laughs> <laughs> Per student? No, or per uh, night. Per per all of us. Total? For all, mm -hmm. Yeah, and she's going to talk a little bit more about that. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Short people. In our 10,000 square foot mansion, we've got five full bedrooms, five full kitchens that are off these no bedrooms. Bathrooms, five full, excuse me. Um, we've got one extra large kitchen that can hold our whole group of gatherings. We have a finished basement that is all kinds of games and activities for the students to do. Um, and everything is included in our price. So all we need to bring is ourself and some food. <laughs> Obviously, I'm going to go through this really quick because you kind of already have an idea of what we do, but independence is what my goal is. So these are like my goals. So selfishly, <coughs> this end of the year trip that I do allows me to assess everything that I've been teaching all year long because obviously my students can go home and I can think they're doing their hygiene, but I really don't know they're doing their hygiene, right? Or they could say that they're looking for a job. I don't really know that or making their bed or anything. Um, so this four days gives me a chance because I am in the same house with them 24-7 watching their every move. I will know what they do and what they don't and they will do, trust me. So those are the things that I want to check. So we're going to establish obviously independent living skills here. We're going to be socializing, have social skills, developing, maintaining relationships, which is one of our biggest goals that we have. Um, so we're going to live together for four days, we're going to share a common space, we're going to respect each other's boundaries just as if they were going to go live in an apartment once they leave me. They have to learn these skills and know that if they're in a room with two other people, this is how we have to proceed to be able to have relationships and have boundaries that we respect. Sharing, bonding, working as a team. Collaborate together, we're going to build menus together, they all already have picked what meals they want to make whatever they're going to prepare. There's breakfast, lunch, dinner, breakfast, lunch, dinner, breakfast, lunch, dinner. We have to do that all in this house. And I don't know if you caught that there's three kitchens plus a big kitchen. So they can prepare and butler it to us if they want. <laughs> anyway, and we're going to do a little bit of barbecuing. Um, so we're going to do grilling and a bonfire, of course. I have schedules that they go by every day in class. And now I'm going to have them go by these schedules in a actual living space. So they will have to complete those schedules and what we call adulting. Even I say that for myself because I still need that. <laughs> Hygiene checklist, huge, just saying. Um, and then we're going to do all kinds of events that we have scheduled for the, throughout the day. I mean, I'm not Susie or what's her name that was on the boat. I'm not going to be that lady on the love boat. Am I showing my age right now? What was her name? Julie. 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 <laughs> She's the cruise director. Cruise director. I'm not going to be Julie. I really just showed my age, didn't I? I'm not going to be the cruise director, but kind of sort of going to be the cruise director. And that, you know, my goal is just to relax and have fun. Um, so everything so far that we do is perfect, I think, but now I'm going to see it all day and all night. So love it. Um, who is, who is, 
Eric, where's he? You got this. Come on. Look at how awesome he's You got this. What are we going to do? We follow schedule, cook meals, bake food for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Outdoor activities and take a cycle out. Clean the schoolhouse, wash the dishes, and use the dishwasher. Make our beds, keep our room clean, play sports, hike, go on a canoe, sightseeing. Doing your own laundry, do role play with team. Team building activities, competitions, have a bonfire with marshmallows. Have fun around the house, learn about Port Austin. Do our hygiene. Be independent. independent. <laughs> How are we going to pay for this? How about make the comedian come up here? <laughs> <laughs> we recycle pop bottles and we get the pop bottles from the Oxford booths. High school boosters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know, Mike. This comedian come up. <laughs> Oxford boosters club and the community, and we return the pop bottles to Myers and get the money. And we get money from Oakland schools, and we get the money from prom, and transition coordination. And we do Legos and we sort them by colors and size and shape. And we make apple pies and kelp corn and snacks and crafts. And the Legos, we, so I, every one of my students has something they can do. When we weren't going out into job sites, we had to stay in, but we still were thinking how we were going to develop these skills. So we met a man who owns a company, and when I say Legos, it's not, let's put a little Lego together. I mean, I got millions. And they, you didn't never realize how many colors of Legos there actually are. <laughs> so even my students who are nonverbal or don't go out in the community, they will sit all day and just make, down to like one piece in a bag. And he pays us per every time we it was oh. all product, so that's a good thing. Cool. Details of the trip? <clears throat> um, details of the trip. Meeting will be held at the Oxford Loft Classroom to fill out all the paperwork and discuss all the details of the trip. It will be mandatory if their child will be attending. This will also solve serve as a question and answer session. Tr transports all tr transporting all students and staff personal vehicles to Fort Austin all staff vehicles are reg re registered um, and insured and all staff is cleared to transport students students attending 14 staff one teacher mrs seco 
<laughs> three pair of pros, Miss Stahl, Miss Heath, and Miss Gillespie. Two parents, Andy and Miss Misty. 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 <laughs> <laughs> We've been working on that name all day, just saying. But they <laughs> own the taxi service in Axford. <laughs> And one volunteer, Miss Mr. Mike, custodian at Ova. Ova. They park June sits from Oxford High School of Plants. Hour and a half hours at eighty four miles each way. Arrived in Port Austin. Check in, check out on June 9th. Return to the high school. All necessary paperwork for chaperoning per Jasper guidelines and protocol will be submitted for their departure. <coughs> understand we didn't put a time for Tuesday because I had to change it because he said we can come whenever we want on Tuesday now so we're gonna leave in the morning if we get approved so it'll be all day Tuesday all day Wednesday all day Thursday and but he said we had to leave by 11 on Friday because he had another group coming up. the cost of the trip we're gonna buy all the food for June 6th 7th 8th and 9th on the 6th we'll need lunch, dinner, and snacks. On the 7th, we'll need breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks. On the 8th, we'll need breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks. On June 9th, we will just be having breakfast and packing up and heading back to the high school. We'll need gas money. We'll need money to pay for the VRBO. We'll need miscellaneous money for firewood, for our bonfire, marshmallows, s'mores, um, roast hot dogs, just have a great old time. <laughs> Activities, teams, and buildings. We What we do is we cook together, eat together, plan meals together, share common spaces together, clean together, hiking, go be go to the beach, play basketball, video game to play video games together, tournament style, do crafts, team building activities, motivation, yoga, er, exercise daily, movie night and popcorn, bonfire night and music, karaoke night, winter winds, fishing, canoeing, and kayaking. That is in there somewhere, I promise. You <laughs> got your last line. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Please say yes. Hello. Um, thank you for listening to our presentation. Do you have any questions at this time we can answer? Bye. Anybody have questions? Are you guys excited to go on this trip? Yes. 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 <laughs> Very. It's, it's awesome. I can't even describe it. I wouldn't do it every year if I didn't think it was worth it. And it really is. I mean, during COVID, that was a rough time. But then, you know, we had a way that we got to go, thanks to Pam, we got to go to uh, Echo Grove. Echo Grove. Yeah. And so in the dead of winter, with our therapy dogs <laughs> for three nights it was awesome we got to team build all together and we just like to be together it's a lot we're together all the time it's my family mm -hmm. so we hope you say yes um and i do I, I guess i didn't put this in here but i do have funds that we can use in our oxford law fund which is going to cover most of it but um i may have to beg and plead for a little because i do have two graduations this year so I have to have a ceremony at some point. But other than that, I think we might have it covered. Okay. They there do we well. We have a couple more catering jobs coming up for open school, so that should be good. And um, we have a couple other things going on. Well, obviously with our Legos. So we're good. 
with that. Very good. I appreciate and everybody listening to this. No. It was great. It was, it was our fantastic. pleasure. Thank it was you. great. Thank you. Any other questions? Anyone? I do have a question. Who was nervous before you started to present? Raise your hand. Well, I'm going to tell you, I'm nervous every time I come up here. And you guys did a great job. Yeah, I think so. so don't be nervous. It was just, it's just us. Just like Mr. Seco said, we're all, we're all part of the family. So it's just us. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Beal, so much for your support and all of your Thank support. you, Pam. Wow. We really Thank you, Jeannie. It. We're going to go ahead and make a motion. Okay? Yes, Amanda. Do you have um, some contact information? Because I find it hard to believe that most of the community is not just dying right now to uh, donate. So where can we send them to possibly donate for your fundraising? Free fundraising. Bottle drive, uh, bottles, any, any of it. The, uh, right at the high school. Or the if, you know yeah. what? If they let us know where they're at, We'll go get them. Okay. We're really good at that. Mm -hmm. You pick up some, some, a woman always donates on Lakeville Road. She yes. she found me on Facebook. She calls me every week and donates other their money. They're housed well. at the high school. I, well, well, the I can tell you that we do have, route. thank you. We do have a bin at um, Central Office that has a lock on it. So if anybody in the community would want to donate any cans. Um, you can drop them off at Central Office, and we'll get them to yeah. to our last program. Or if they wanted to donate money directly, I'm sure that they could do that. You can as reach well. out to me as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Are, are we taking a picture? Quick picture. Why don't you turn Let's around? Let's do a quick picture, and then yeah. we're gonna they're gonna vote tonight. Did you guys hear that? I did. Wow. <laughs> yes, I'm so excited. We're in the back. Okay, we're we're cool. Cool. Can you guys yeah. back up just a little bit so I can get you all? Seth. <laughs> Better. Can we scoot over just a little bit? We don't bite. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's my wig. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes. I would like to move to approve the loft, the learning opportunities for tomorrow's trip. I just thank you for presenting it. Thank you for coming and uh, bringing all your hearts and your hard work and your research and and presenting it to us. And uh, I just I think you guys are awesome. And I think Jeannie's amazing and her staff. And so I'd like to move to approve the uh, the loft field trip request. Yeah, move to approve the loft field trip request. Is there a second? Second, Mr. Summers. Okay. All in favor? Or yeah. I'm sorry, discussion? I, I just had a I just had a comment. I just had a comment. I was so excited to hear that you're at Oakland Schools because guys, yeah. you just make the best pies. And if you haven't had a thing <laughs> uh, on the log, so, uh, yeah, you need one. So keep that in mind when they open that that little cafeteria again, we want to be first on the list to run that place. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Great work, team. Thank love you. it. Love it, love it, love it. Any other questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Going to Port Austin. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> 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 
So that puts us to item number four, the superintendent's report. Dr. Markovich. Right. Well, and I'm going to introduce Steve Wolf, who's going to try to outdo that. I, Steve, I, I'm glad it's you following that and not me. Um, My goodness, I'm sitting I, here thinking, how do you follow that group? I know it, I know it. But um, we have completed uh, the bullying survey that um, uh, we have mentioned frequently that we were going to have done and we have those results. Um, Steve is going to hit the highlights for you tonight, and I know that some of you on the board is going to want to see all the raw data to all the questions. Yes, I'm not pointing to anyone, but um, uh, so... We're not looking at anybody in particular. Right, we're not looking at anyone in particular. So uh, after tonight, we will also send the entire set of uh, raw data question by question to you. But Steve, go ahead. Well, I guess we're going to really shift gears here. <laughs> um, so we had uh, seven of our buildings administer the Oveas bully, uh, Bullying Survey uh, in March, and that included Clear Lake, Oxford Elementary, Lakeville, Leonard, Bridges, OMS, and OHS, and this is a survey done nationally given to students in grades 3 through 12. Uh, so we just got done getting those results. We put this presentation together. Um, to just really kind of skim the surface on some of the key points in the results. It is not going to cover uh, all of the questions because that would include 42 questions and even some sub-questions within them uh, for seven buildings. So you do the math on that, that would be a lot of information to share tonight, uh, and we're not going to do that. Uh, we are happy to provide the full results from each building to you after tonight. That way you can do a deeper dive uh, and follow up with any detailed questions you might have about each of the building or the, the district overall. So. Uh, Sean Marshall, who is uh, off to my left here, is our data specialist in the curriculum department, and she has done an outstanding job helping to aggregate and pull this data together. Uh, she is fantastic. So she's worked uh, pretty hard and quickly here with the results uh, to get them up and share with you. Uh, what is o Oveas? Well, it's Dan Oveas, who is a Swedish-Norwegian psychologist who worked uh, at the university level in Sweden uh, in the 1970s and 80s, and he pioneered research on bullying and bullying prevention in the 70s and 80s, uh, and eventually conducted the first systematic study of bully intervention and intervention programs in the 80s, and then that made its way from Norway to the United States uh, in the mid-90s and really kind of picked up steam at uh, school and district level uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, Oxford, I believe, uh, adopted this program uh, back in the 2015-2016 school year at Oxford High School uh, and then Oxford Middle School. And then following that in successive years, some of the elementaries have picked up that bully prevention program. So uh, it's been around a little while at the secondary level, a little more recent at the elementary level. So this, qu this questionnaire is historically taken every two years uh, by design uh, per the organization. Uh, we last gave this survey in 2018. Uh, 2020 uh, was interrupted by the COVID shutdown, so we were unable to take that survey. Uh, we generally give it in the spring, and that's the time of which uh, we were shut down. Uh, the next opportunity then was in 2022, last school year. Uh, however, we had our focus, obviously, in some other areas uh, in the spring, and so we did not take that survey. We did roll that question around in our head, should we take it? Uh, but we had really shifted all of our attention to the recovery and the needs of our students in other areas. So we did not give it last year. Uh, we were able to take it in that off biannual uh, succession this year, this last March, and that's what we're going to go through today are some of those results. So this questionnaire is anonymous, so students don't report their, uh, their names, but they do share their grade level, uh, their race, ethnicity, um, etc. It's a multiple choice questionnaire and it's designed to measure a number of aspects of bullying in schools and school districts. Um, the results are used to assist at the building and district level in planning bully prevention education, also evaluating those programs year end after year, um, and redesigning supervision in targeted areas based on what the results share. So the survey really does two things. It shares with you and gives you insight on what bullying might be taking place, with whom and where and what frequency and what types of bullying, uh, but then it also is used as a program evaluation in itself 
based on how you're educating students and staff uh, on appropriate behaviors, how to be aware of bullying, uh, how to report bullying, how to be an upstander, quote unquote, versus a bystander just watching. Um, and this results in the data helps us identify those trends throughout each of the buildings. So it can be also used in succession with other school climate surveys, uh, which we do intend to do here shortly uh, with some district surveying just sent out recently. And again, it provides a baseline data to measure. I would almost say this is, this is almost like a refresh in a baseline data in itself because we've had such a long period since we've given it and we've had such an interrupted in learning at each building level due to COVID and then last year's tragedy. So uh, some of the results may reflect that a little bit. Uh, overall, nationally, the trend, they are anticipating that uh, overall bullying uh, will likely go up uh, based on students being removed from the school environment, being removed from their peers, those peer groups, uh, and kind of losing a little bit of sense of how to inter interact and be uh, kind and friendly to one another. So. We are going to start first with Oxford High School, and we're gonna go in a little more detail with the high school and the middle school, and then we'll go in less detail with Bridges and the elementaries, just to keep the, uh, the presentation at uh, a decent length here. So, this table right here shows a frequency of students, both boys and girls combined, being bullied or not, based on the grade level and compared to the last survey date from 2018. And so I'll give you a second to glance over that. But you can see a slight increase in most grade levels for students not bullied compared to 2018, which is good data for the high school in general. There's some slight variance, whether it's above or below uh, this current year compared to 2018 with bully frequency ranges across the board. But overall, that top row not bullied, we see uh, overall an increase, which is a good thing to report for the Oxford High School. So the table and the graph here focus on the various ways of bullying, girls and boys combined, in the two to three times a month or more range. So when students answer that question, they have some options. I'm not bullied, I'm bullied once, I'm bullied two or three times, multiple times, etc. cetera. Uh, gives kind of a Likert scale for students to select. And so what this chart and graph does is it combines any students who chose two, three, or more throughout that survey of their frequency of being bullied. And so you can see, uh, again, a slight increase in most grade levels across the board. Now, Oveus only provides the national <coughs> average, which in the graph to the right is that yellow diamond uh, for some of the questions. So you won't see that across the board. Um, they're in quite a few of the slides that we have here tonight, uh, but by sheer number of those questions throughout uh, the 42 question survey, there's not very many that give you the national comparison of the average to share with. Uh, that national average uh, from 2018 is the results of nationwide trends for 2014-15 year. It's kind of confusing but they go back from a few years prior to put that 2018 national average together. And then for 2023, they combined the 2015 to 2019 results across the country to develop a, a national comparison or an average. Okay, so that's not the 2023 national average. They haven't aggregated that data uh, altogether. So it's a little bit confusing. I just wanted to note that because you'll see some differences throughout the slide that don't necessarily match up. You may catch that. All right, so the 2023 national average was calculated. I went over that. Uh, other student behavior suggests bullying and other trends may increase. We've received that in some of the reports. OHS here is much below the 2015-19 national average. On all measures in grades 9 through 11 have experienced a decrease overall compared to the 2018 results. So some more good news there if you're looking at the graph off to the right from 2023. So graph seven here also focuses on the various ways of being bullied. Again, two to three times a month or more, it combined different selections. It shows a comparison of boys in green and girls in blue, but that's for 2023 only. 
Keep in mind the questionnaire doesn't require students to answer every single one of these selections. So if you added those percentages up, they might not add to 100%, depending on if, if some kids selected or not. Most did, but not 100% of those students. You can see OHS is much below the 2015-2019 national average. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong slide here, sorry. The, the big things that jump out in this graph here, the exclusion amongst boys versus girls, the rumors, and a few other areas that pop up. So that's some data at the high school that they're going to be looking at. Each of the buildings has different teams that are getting together, some of which have already started to go through the data and start identifying some trends. And then, of course, looking at uh, their advisory lessons, their PBIS programs, their SEL programs, and where do we want to start targeting some certain areas and revisit with our students what those expectations are uh, and work with our staff to better help identify uh, and work on some of these behaviors across the building. So this table or this graph here shows where the bullying has occurred at the high school for students who reported being bullied once or twice or more, it's a combined number, and the percentage of the students who reported being bullied in various places. And so you can see the hallways was the biggest reported area for the high school this year, followed by the lunchroom, uh, and then in class coming in third place. This table and graph here shows us a percent of bullied students, boys and girls combined, who have reported the behavior of bullying to various people. The table on the left compares the 2018 to 2013 difference, but then the graph on the right is only for the 2023 data, uh, which shows that most recent national comparison. So compared to that national average, OHS has more students this year who are reporting to teachers, reporting to parents and friends compared with 2018. And you can see that OHS is below the national average. Also, we have less students not reporting bullying to those groups compared to 2018, which is good. And to improve this further, all buildings, including the high school, are going to be placing up uh, here this week and next week posters uh, at some of the entrances and in the bathroom so it's confidential uh, where students can anonymously report. That way we can have an easier method for students where they don't feel pressured or concerned that others are worried that they're reporting the bullying. Um, they could do so anonymously, uh, to which we've gone through some processes at the building level on how to respond to those students reporting being bullied. So this table and graph represents empathy towards victims and described in feeling sorry for or wanting help after the fact. The table on the left shows comparison of 2018 versus 2023, while the graph on the right only shows the 2023 results. And you can see we have a slight dip from 2018, uh, but OHS is still above the national average. Of course, we want to improve. Um, we have different uh, programs across the district, one of which would be restorative circles potentially uh, to help mitigate some of these issues that we're seeing here with the empathy. So this table and graph show how often adults try to put a stop to bullying at the school, uh, as reported by students, um, and those options students chose, which they combined here, where often and almost always staff tries to intervene. The table on the left is 2018 versus 2023, and the graph on the right shows our 2023 results. So you can see OHS is consistent with 2018. Uh, but now slightly below the national average. So this table and chart shows student isolation by sharing the percent of students who feel they have no friends or only one good friend in their classes. So not necessarily across the school overall, but in their classes. Uh, table on the left shows 2018 versus 2023 in the graph. On the right shows the 2023 results only. Here we have a slight increase in boys and girls combined from 2018, which may be the result of COVID. Um, today's purpose and presentation is not to, to examine the results, but merely show them to you, point out a few obvious facts. 
Uh, the high school has recently surveyed students on their trusted adult um, to help connect students with staff. This is a different question, asking students about their, their connectivity with other students throughout the building. So you're starting to see the survey goes beyond just individual bullying. It really starts to peer into a school culture and climate survey, uh, which you can have a lot of takeaways at the building level from, uh, including looking at some of your other programs, which would, in theory, support some of the bullying behavior. So this table and graph, let me see here shows a percent of students who dislike or very much dislike school. Table on the left is 2018 to 23, and the graph on the right is for 2023 results only. So we do see a slight increase from 2018, which brings OHS above the national comparison. Uh, overall, we currently see boys reporting they dislike school at a higher rate as compared to the girls. So that wraps up the, the high school. Again, we'll, we'll share the full graph results uh, with the board for you to take a deeper dive into that after tonight's board meeting. Uh, we're gonna move on to the middle school here, do another deep dive, and then we'll follow up with Bridges and the elementaries. Can I ask a quick question? Mm -hmm. So you gave this to all the students during what, like advisory? Or? In uh, middle school and high school in their advisory class, uh, in the elementaries, uh, they selected a class during the school day where all students took it at around the same time. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I mean, unless they were absent, they took the survey, they kind of had to? Correct, yeah, the high school had a, about 75% of students take the survey. Uh, we were gonna experience about seven to 9% of students being average any given day. Um, and then we have uh, students in different programs who come and go at different times. Yeah which is gonna bring you below that 90-ish you know, percent. Um, but we did carve that time out consistently with the expectation that every student take it. Uh, so our percent of students taken at the high school was higher than in previous years, uh, which is good. Uh, same thing across the board at the middle school um, and at the elementaries. Okay. Yep. So on to the middle school here. This table again shows the frequency of students, boys and girls, being bullied or not based on grade level and compared to the last survey date of 2018. And so overall we have a slight increase in bullying from that last survey date at most grade levels and at the different frequency occurrences. There's no one grade level of frequency that, that really jumps out in this, in this table, uh, but overall seventh grade has experienced the lowest increase uh, when compared with sixth and eighth grade. So this table and graph cuts into the various ways of bullying, boys and girls combined. This is the two to three times a month or more, so it adds some of those choices together. The table on the left is the change from last survey to this year, and the graph on the right shows 2023 data only. So this change from last survey has taken OMS above the national average in grades six and eight, and we see the lowest frequency rate among our current seventh grade class, uh, which still falls below the national average. So you can see some grade level trends. Uh, we tried initially looking at, hey, let's, let's look at our uh, sixth grade students uh, from 2018, and let's jump ahead five years and see where they're at as a junior. Um, there, was, there was no real correlation that jumped out with us. Um, there's a lot of variables that come into play. First of all, students mature, students grow and change, uh, but overall we really didn't follow one subgroup across grade levels from 2018 to 23 uh, to see something jumped out necessarily. So Steve, I just wanna make sure I'm reading the chart right. You said sixth and eighth were above national average, but I think only eighth was above. I apologize, yep, okay, you are correct. So here we look at the various ways of bullying, two to three times a month or more, those combined student choices, 
shows a comparison of boys and girls. Um, and this is for the 2023 data only, this most recent survey. Here we can see more bullying takes place in the various ways uh, indicated by girls compared with boys uh, when we're looking at ways such as rumors. Another example would be exclusion and cyberbullying. This data is really beneficial when you're going through some of those PBIS lessons with our middle school students. Um, the foundation of PBIS is going over uh, and reviewing what behavioral expectations we have with students. That way they know what, what we expect of them um, and things we want to work on. And this is a great data for the middle school to dive into uh, and work on some of those lessons with students. We have our high school mentorship class. Uh, which comes to the middle school about two or three times every two weeks and they help deliver Oveas bully prevention lessons with the students. Uh, they go into those advisory classes uh, during the days leading up to those OMS visits. They, uh, they go through some of the lessons, they rewrite them, re they revise it, they role play, and then they carry out those lessons with the middle school students uh, to kind of set the stage and the expectation for uh, how we want to act and behave. Um, so modeling with the upperclassmen and themselves showing students because they often will look up to them uh, knowing they'll be at the high school really soon and this is some good data to uh, to share with those mentorship students so this table shows us where bullying has occurred girls and boys combined the different locations and here you can see the hallways lunchroom and in class in that order are the most frequent locations and so again we want to target this behavior with our PBIS lessons also helps with staff supervision where do we want to change up where we're placing ourselves being present being visible how are we stepping in and correcting if we're making observations as staff with student behaviors So this table and graph shows us the percent of bullied students, boys and girls combined, who have reported the behavior to various people. The table on the left is 2018 versus 2023, and the graph on the right is just the 2023 data. We currently have more students reporting to parents uh, right now compared to 2018. And we also see that OMS is about at or above the national comparison of reporting to teachers parents, siblings, and friends, and they're slightly below the national comparison of not telling anyone, uh, all of which are good signs. Some areas for improvement in reporting uh, would be to our teachers, uh, which we see a decrease in 2018. Again, we're going to have some uh, bullying posters up uh, for students who hit a QR code and anonymously, anonymously report, but we still want students to feel comfortable to go to an adult, especially their trusted adult. Uh, which is an activity that we do at the middle school and high school to see how connected students are to our adults. Here again we have empathy. Um, empathy towards victims and feeling sorry for, quote unquote, or wanting to help afterwards. The table on the left is that comparison over years and the right is the current results. And so we see less empathy overall compared to 2018. And although it drops OMS below the national average, they're still very much in that national comparison range. Of course, we want to improve, and there are various programs to which we can uh, target some of that expectation with our students. One of which that I mentioned was uh, restorative circles. The high school staff has been fully trained this year, and we've made a lot of progress with the middle school staff. Uh, we intend to have all the middle school staff trained next year. Uh, that way they can implement it not just as an intervention, but also as a method to, uh, to lay out their instruction in our content areas. Uh, it's not just to resolve conflict, it's also a way to deliver instruction and to create some connectivity in our, in our classrooms. So this table and graph shows how adults at the middle school try to put a stop to bullying specifically in the student survey options of often or almost always. And although we see a slight drop in staff interventions uh, compared to 2018, OMS is still 
uh, right there with, within range of the national comparison. Moving on, this table and chart shows student isolation by sharing the percent of students who feel they have no friends or only one good friend in their classes. Uh, so again, not necessarily overall in the building. The left is that comparison and the right are the current year's results. And so we do see a decrease in reported isol uh, social isolation, which is good. Uh, now we're right near that national average or comparison. So again, left-hand side table is the comparison of years, and the right side is the current graph of this year's results. So we do see a slight increase, uh, but not a substantial change. And still right there near the national average. A little bit above in sixth grade with girls and sixth to eighth, eighth grade girls and boys combined. All right, so that is OMS. Bridges High School also took the survey. Uh, they don't have an advisory class. They have some similar uh, periods throughout the day um, by comparison, and so uh, we had students take it all on one day. If a student was absent in any building, we chose not to do a makeup day, um, knowing this, this survey was taken by all students and they had a good idea of it, probably some discussion amongst themselves, and we wanted to make sure the, the results were authentic and real time. Uh, that way they weren't spilling over for kids we were trying to get caught up and, and made up, uh, especially pulling kids out of their content core classes to give the survey. Uh, we chose to give that one-time snapshot uh, on that school day. Uh, if you recall, Bridges has a smaller population, uh, usually anywhere between 35 and 45 students, depending on the year. I believe this year they had um, uh, all but one student who was absent take the survey, which is good. This was the first time that Bridges uh, took the survey. They had not take, taken it previously. Um, it is such a, a small, tight-knit community. Uh, in previous years, I don't believe we thought there was necessarily a need for it. Uh, not to suggest there aren't any bullying behaviors whatsoever, uh, but because of the environment and the connection amongst that small population, um, we generally don't see some of those behaviors. Uh, but we decided to, to administer the Bridges uh, survey anyhow. The unfortunate thing with uh, these results are that to keep anonymity, uh, Oveus, um, you really have to have more than 15 students per grade level hit the survey to do a grade level breakdown. Uh, otherwise, if you have a small sample group amongst larger samples, you might be able to figure out who reported what. Uh, and that's why they had that 15 number minimum. And so, you know, unfortunately, we did have to chunk it into just one grade level. We just chose the middle, 11 as Bridges students attend uh, grades 10, 11, and 12. Um, the data, however, um, I, I would say suggests that probably wasn't even necessary because we do have uh, some great results. Over 91% of students uh, reporting they have not been bullied. Um, if I did the math correctly, we had you know, approximately three students indicate to some extent they have been bullied, uh, which is uh, only a few, and that's great. So like our elementaries, I'm only going to go into a few slides, uh, that way we can move along here um, and make this a little bit briefer for our remaining schools. So this table and graph focuses on the various ways of bullying, girls and boys combined, two to three times a month or more. Keep in mind this is the national comparison for juniors on that bottom row, which isn't the representation of all grades of the students who took it. So in other words, you could assumably cut that percent maybe into thirds on average if you wanted to for the girls and boys at Bridges. And so I would suggest at each grade level we would be below that national comparison. So this graph here shows us where bullying has occurred for boys and girls combined. Uh, anyone who reported a frequency of one to two more times and we can see it's only been reported here 
uh, in the hallways still below the national comparison for 2023. Okay, on to our elementaries. Are you guys still with me? Yep. Okay. Okay. So we're just going to go in alphabetical order here. Claire Lake, uh, again, students in grades three through five only were surveyed. This table shows the frequency of students, boys and girls combined, who are being bullied or not based on grade level and as compared to last survey day from 2018. So we have a slight increase in bullying from 2018 across <coughs> most grade levels and across most frequencies and occurrences. And we also see a decrease in students reporting that they have not been bullying, and so there's some room for improvement here. So this table and graph focuses on the various ways of bullying Boys and girls combined two to three times a month or more. Graph on the right is for this current year data only. And we can see fourth grade fairly steady from 2018 uh, and still below the national comparison, but an increase in grades three and five, uh, now above the national average in grades three and five. So last slide for Clear Lake, this is the percent of bullied students, boys and girls combined, who have reported the behavior to various people. You can see we have more students reporting to a teacher or adult compared to 2018, which now brings us over the national average. We're pretty consistent with other people uh, or other students who have selected they reported bullying from 2018 to 23, either being above or at the national average. We can see an increase in students not telling anyone, which is below the national average. And so again, there's some opportunity for some education uh, throughout the building, some awareness moving forward. Okay, moving on to Lakeville elementary. This table shows the frequency of students, boys and girls combined, being bullied or not based on grade level and compared to 2018. You can see a decrease in students reporting they have not been bullied in grades three and four, but an increase in grades in grade five. Did I get that backwards? Yeah. Four, 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 four I apologize. I'm getting dizzy, Dr. Uh, yeah, Markovich, with all these numbers and yeah, I, I know. data. I, I think the board can actually read the charts. I don't think, you know, maybe we have to verbalize every one. So right. okay. maybe just let us so, look at them. Real quick question, Steve. That um, two or three times per month in 2023 fourth grade, 0.0%, 0 .0%, <laughs> is that an anomaly or is that something that is in fact, and I see the same thing from 2018. Yeah. Oh, Lake Hill, fourth grade. Yeah, no, no students who reported on that line. In that frequency. Okay. <coughs> so they would jump to either never been or another time period. Or a higher frequency. Okay. <laughs> Keep in mind, we're, we're without looking up the number of students, maybe 60, 70 students total in that grade level. Any questions on that one? No. Okay. <coughs> okay, percent of bullied students who reported bullying, boys and girls combined, uh, to various people. <coughs> Qu 
questions on this slide? Here we're at Leonard Elementary. It says a breakdown from 2018 to 23 at the different frequency rates. slide. So percent of bullied students, boys and girls combined. last elementary surveyed Oxford Elementary. This is that grade level breakdown by frequency in the last two survey years. There's another zero percent, Dan. on we've got the various ways of bullying wait nope we got the percent of girls and boys two or three or more So this is our last data slide for our last school. And overall, we, we certainly have some areas that we've remained uh, above or better than the national comparison in some areas where we've fallen below or have historically been below. Uh, our standard um, isn't necessarily just the national comparison. Uh, of course, we want to be below it, much much more below it, um, and have better data than that, but we're also compared to ourselves, which is the purpose of the survey, to look at your own results, to make your own program changes and improvements at your own building. So you're really comparing the data uh, of yourself to make those changes. And so again, as I mentioned, buildings are going through this data. I am looking at their current programs and areas they want to put some focus into. And this does spill uh, outside of just their bully prevention programs, uh, does spill into a lot of the, the work they do in the classrooms and building wide for their school culture and climate. That was a lot. <laughs> and I got a bit tongue tied, so I apologize. It's okay. Does anybody have any questions? I, I do have a question. Mike. Um, I think a lot, some of them, I'll, I'll wait for the raw data mm -hmm. uh, because that might answer a couple ones I wrote down yesterday. But, um, as far as like the national average, when you send the email out, can you explain that better? Yeah, as yeah. far as uh, the 2023, um, I noticed across just across the board, uh, comparing the elementary schools, specifically telling a teacher, reporting to a teacher, mm -hmm. uh, Clear Lake at first, when it being the first, right, it kind of blew it out of the water. But I noticed it was really low in 2018. Mm -hmm. So it had a 30% jump, but it was it was low, and the other schools kind of flipped that. And so it's just interesting. Maybe it was something they're doing, or maybe some, you know, certainly they made a, a great improvement, <coughs> uh, jumping 30 percentage points. Um, but I see that some of the other schools seem to seem to flip that. So um, interesting. I was thinking kind of awareness, just in general. That's like high school. It seems like making it aware, making it okay. 
Um, uh, but um, let me see. Yeah, the 2018 results were uh, more recent to some of the assemblies held at the elementaries. Uh, where we would come in, even bring some of the high school kids again, who would work with the middle school students to kind of either launch it or revisit it, uh, just raise some awareness around it, how it's not cool and this is not what we do here, uh, kind of setting that tone and that expectation. Uh, we haven't had assemblies in the last two school years. Uh, that may have some of the impact on it, um, but there are certainly some, some program questions within the buildings as well to look at. Okay, um, the, will the raw data show what percentage of students answered each question? So there's the, the raw, raw data uh, is uh, not organized uh, all that well. When they send it to you, we did make that additional request. Um, it, would, it would take weeks and months to go through and try to really aggregate um, that data. They only give you a percentage of those who took the survey by grade level, not necessarily by each individual question. So if you had 100 kids take the survey in its entirety and five kids somehow didn't choose to select question three, it won't necessarily show you that. Because okay. I was looking specifically for what, I, what stuck to me was graph seven on high school and that it looked like the boys, that's where, where bullying was, or no, sorry, the type of bullying. Mm -hmm. It looks like the boys only reported by 30%. It does well, not have to 100. Yeah. Not at all. Like yeah. it's not, not that close, right? Whereas yeah. the middle school, it's like not, it's like 80 high 80s, right? Yep. So I was just curious. Um, is there an anonymous way for students without cell phones, specifically at the middle school, to report? Yeah, uh, it, as well as the elementary. Uh, yeah. Elementary students won't have a cell I phone guess. with them. Right. Uh, these posters were uh, done at the board office, so they're very uh, well designed, and they have a QR code. That doesn't help students who do not have a cell phone. And so uh, middle school students and elementary students uh, raising that awareness through their advisory class of who to report to, how to do so confidential, um, confidentially, uh, if you have an issue, uh, inviting that space for them to know how to do it. It, it may be a, a box in the uh, office. It may be something in a media center. Every building has to kind of sort out what would work best for them. Okay. Hi, Aaron. So, um, just looking through, particularly the elementary data right now. I think I would be curious to see what a roll up between buildings looks like, because it looks like we have some buildings that. Um, didn't dip down and some that did and I guess when you guys are going through and developing plans you know obviously things are working better at some schools than others um, the other um, point would be in, in general and this is for anyone working on the plan is like things like the posters are rolled out or other interventions I think it's a, an important that there's a communication plan that's wrapped around all of these initiatives that are being done because if our families at home don't have awareness as well now we can't force them to read the emails or to look at the things but if we've given them information um, and then just to pivot off the the um the cell phone comment most middle schoolers have a chromebook right uh, if not all of them there should potentially be low right on their desktop yeah, the chromebooks item. can take a um you know qr code screenshot yeah um we talked to students beforehand, and I think the, the bathroom stalls were like the number one place I recommended because there's just, it's private. Uh, no one's going to see you do it. We don't let students, unfortunately, bring their Chromebooks into the restroom. Uh, and no, so I mean, like on their desktop of the Chromebook, yeah, you can. Like, we also oh, talked about class right link. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think a, an elementary dashboard roll up, I guess, when you send the data, that would be helpful because sliding through all the slides, is, I just were kind of cross checking all those things. Um, and it would be interesting if a waitlist could, because the dips in the elementary level are, some of them are pretty substantial, to see if they can give us at least the 2023 comparison, not the 20, the national average, which is taking data from pre COVID, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Because I think that's just statistically looking at it that's probably where a lot of those dips have come from is the interactions of children that missed a, a great deal of school yeah we don't have an indication of when that national comparison um, will be generated where it will be more more recent um, but we hope that'll be pretty soon 
think the other thing that, I mean, obviously information is going to lead a lot of the planning, but the one thing it does point out and makes it clear, which is kind of the way we've been doing it since we've been trying to do it, is that every building, even in some cases every grade level, is different. And we're probably not going to find a solution that is, you know, one glove fits all hands here. It's probably going to be the kind of solution that's more targeted. Um, and as you said, borrowing from places where we seem to have better results and places where we, uh, where we don't. And, and I don't know how long it would take Sean to do the elementary roll-up that you asked. I'm not sure we can get it out to you tomorrow, like we can get out the raw data. But I will tell you that everywhere else I've ever worked, I have been anointed the data queen, but I have given my crown <laughs> over to Sean uh, from this point on. Um, so I'm sure we can eventually do that. But I bet when we roll it off, roll it up, I think what we will see is that in every building, some things went up, whereas other things went down. And in each building, that's different. So I, I think we're going to also find a lot of variability there which will help our teachers as they collaborate with each other across buildings, help our principals as they collaborate across buildings. But I think we're on the right track, having targeted specialized interventions, building by building, age group by age group, rather than trying to solve this in one fell swoop. Any other questions? Mary. A comment, thank you. Uh, thank, you for the, um, thank you for the data, Steve, because we have to start, we have to know what we're um, what we're addressing before we can start um, addressing anything. And um, to Aaron's point, I think it's really difficult to even compare these two years. I mean, I think these are just totally, these are very different points um, in time and in culture. Uh, you said that every two years is the schedule to do Correct. this? Yeah. Um, and you think that, um, do you think if, um, like that's how the programs run. Could we do this in another year or would the data just not even be good because we haven't had enough time to um, to fully implement the programs? I, I'm just not. I think if you were starting it fresh, brand new, it had never been introduced, you'd probably want to wait two years at least to see that rate of change. Um, but this has been around for a while. And we certainly had some lap in, in learning in our programs, uh, which may suggest for some of the dips, um, but it's not a brand new program in itself. So uh, if we chose to do it next year, it would be a cost. Uh, that's something we would factor in to say, do we want to see that year end over change based on the changes we put in place? Yeah, and if, if, you, if we think it would be helpful, I mean, if it's not really going to give us good data, I don't want data just to have some more numbers. Well, I think um, it'll give us good I think it'll give us good data in terms of it'll give us data in terms of what change have we seen in one year. And when you're trying to do an intervention and get some movement, I typically prefer annual mm -hmm. until we get to the point where you're pretty much seeing a trend going in the direction you want. And then maybe after that is established and you feel secure and confident about it, then you can start maybe going every other year. So um, I. I think my preference next year will probably be to do it again, um, but that's one of the things that every building will, will look at as they look at their results. But that would be my um, tendency. My, if you ask me to decide tonight, that would probably be the decision, right. uh, unless something else occurs to cause that to change. Am I out of time? <laughs> you know, it's for me, Vicki. <laughs> um, well, and I think. It would help us to, but as you as you mentioned at the beginning, I mean, we're really establishing a new baseline here, um, yeah. so that will help us start with some trend data because this is these are just snapshots. So it could have just been how people were feeling on that day. Um, so, uh, but I appreciate I appreciate all the data because um, our work is data driven. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. I, I do have one question. It's, it's my assumption that we're going to use this information to build out some of our PBIS strategies moving forward. Correct. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Steve. And thank you, Sean. Yes. <laughs> All right, item number five, uh, we do not, we did not have any, uh, any
anybody request to speak to an agenda item, so we're going to go by that. And um, item number six, uh, there's the consent agenda, which is uh, the minutes of March 14th, our regular meeting, minutes of March 14th, our closed session meeting, our bills payable, and our new hire recommendations. There's a motion. Somebody like to make that? Move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Is there support? Support James. Uh, any discussion? I did want to point out one thing. Um, I asked um, Connie today. I noticed that the that March bills payable number was uh, about a couple, two or three million dollars higher than what we typically are. And just for clarification, um, and she explained it really well, so even I could understand it. So the um, state gave us a MIPSERS payment of $4 million, which we will make payments over a period of the remainder of this calendar year, but 2 million of that or 1.8 million of that came this month. So we'll see, we'll see the remainder of that come off <coughs> from now until the end of the calendar year. So if you go through your, your, your bills payable, it'll be in that where you'll see a MIPSERS amount paid to, to the district of $4 million. And then it comes right back out in the total. It was actually um, just a, it's a little under that we have to left to pay is 1.8 million. So that's why our March bills payable it was up a couple million dollars. Um, you just have to ask for the vote. I know. Yeah. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Of course. Yes. Um, item seven. There is a. Um, it was presented last board meeting. A field trip for the football team. Um, and there is a motion. Can I have a? Would somebody like to make that motion? Uh, Mary. Move to approve the Oxford High School varsity football trip field re football field trip request to Covenant Hills Camp, July twenty fourth through twenty six. 2023 is there support support Amanda any discussion okay no. all in favor aye. aye opposed motion carries so we've already done item B which is the loft presentation and thank you again for that great presentation um, it just goes to show you the 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 effort that this district puts into every student in our district so I'm very proud of that and we should all be in our community should be proud of that um, if we could have uh, a five-minute break, uh, and we'll re we'll come back to the table at 8:35. Is that good? That'd be great. All right, thank, thank you. you.
Yeah, we're going to have a slight change uh, in the agenda to move our presentation from Lighthouse Connections Academy. We have, we, it was presented at our last board meeting and we have a board member approval that we need to do. We have three folks from Lighthouse, our, our partner, and, and we want to get them in and, and, and out of here. It should be just a quick presentation. So uh, we're gonna do that real quick and then we'll jump back into the, into the, uh, into the agenda. <laughs> All right, so the first item is the, the third board member. I spoke about this last month, mm -hmm. um, but we need to do the same type of thing that we did before, but this is for Charles Wansdell um, to be approved to be part of the Lighthouse Connection Academy board. Okay. Yes, there is a motion. Go ahead, Heather. Move to appoint Charles Wansdell to the Lighthouse Connections Academy board of directors as recommended. Is there support? Support Mary. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Mm -hmm. And the next item with Lighthouse Connections Academy is they are going through their reauthorization, and as our partner, as we're their partner, I have Beth Chandler here to present a little bit about that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Hello. Hi, everybody. I um, actually am not. I am your director of charter schools so i am an oxford person and then brought along a couple folks from uh, lighthouse academy and pearson um so I, just a quick little overview for you guys uh, to clarify things and offer you the opportunity to ask any questions um in 2018 oxford schools had the vision and foresight to authorize lighthouse connections academy and um over the past Five years they have served, they currently serve almost 2,500 students that represent 1,700 families across the state of Michigan. These are Oxford District kids. Um, and so this arrangement between a public school and a charter school is one of about 10 in the state. So it's a little bit rare, but, but it does happen. Um, and I just wanted to let you guys know that you should be proud of the impact I'm watching tonight in this meeting. The impact you're having within your district has just been like, I wish I had Kleenex with me because it's just really moving what's happening here with Oxford. But you guys should be proud of what you're doing across the state through Lighthouse, through your charter of this online school. Um, Lighthouse, in partnership with Pearson Virtual Schools, who is one of the most experienced, successful, and reputable educational service providers in the country, um, has been offering this educational experience for the last five years to all those families I mentioned. And in fact, the 2021-22 Parent Satisfaction Survey indicated that 93.3% of their families would recommend to another family who doesn't have a student at Lighthouse to enroll their kids there. Um, so I think that speaks volumes, mm -hmm. as does the fact that one of the board members you appointed last meeting is actually a parent. It's been her first year with a student at Lighthouse who's a special needs student, and she has been so blown away by the, uh, the culture and the, the support that her child has gotten that she decided to get on board and be a part of the organization. So I think, again, those things speak volumes to the impact you guys are having by this authorization. Um, I did bring along uh, Brian Pearson, who is with Pearson. He's the director of schools. And Teresa I'm not Woods. Part of the family. Brian okay. Austin. I'm sorry, Brian <laughs> Pearson. Brian <laughs> Austin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, and then Teresa Woods, who's the school leader um, at Lighthouse, basically the superintendent. Um, I've been working with this team and, and all the folks around them this year for their reauthorization. They're um, up for another five-year authorization, and Doug McNeil also was hoping to be able to be here remotely, um, but we didn't have that capacity tonight, so he said to, to let you know he is your special counsel as authorizer to this uh, charter school. Um, he has been... Um, in that role with you for the last five years and has 
been guiding the development of the contract that you received that you'll be approving tonight uh, if all goes well. Um, he also said if, if you have any questions for him, I can contact him and make sure you get those answered before the charter is actually approved and sent off to MDE. Okay. So if those questions come up. Um, I just I, yeah wanted to add some more positive just that the Lighthouse is a, a stellar example of an organization that really strives to be the gold standard in what they do. Um, anything, there have been a lot of shifting. Dr. Mar Markovich is new. I came on under Ken Weaver, so I was new to them. Dr. Markovich is new to them. Uh, Teresa is relatively new to the school, so there's been a lot going on. And so I think they have felt maybe like they're kind of chasing their tails. We're requesting this and that, and we're doing board members this way now like we're supposed to. But incredible responsiveness, uh, resourcefulness, great team. Um, so I unequivocally recommend the approval of their five-year contract and reauthorization. Um, in the what to expect category, after you approve the contract, it's going to be um, approved Thursday at the Lighthouse meeting, and then Oxford will send it through the GEMS system, which might be great to you guys, but send it into the Michigan Department of Ed for um, approval there. And they may have some questions, but Doug, between Doug and Brian and, and Teresa and the whole team, we'll make sure that those are answered and, um, and that this proceeds. Any questions for me or either of these folks that are here or for Doug, me to convey to Doug? I know there was some hefty paperwork. Uh, it was a little. Yep, yep. yep. In, yeah. in, in the application, but that just goes to show how thorough. Light reading. In light yeah. reading, yes. Uh, how thorough this group is. Yeah. is. Is Jay still with your organization? Uh, Jay Redding, he is not, as okay. of a year ago. Okay. I will say one of the first questions when uh, you came to visit me was what's our completion rate? Right? Absolutely. Graduation rate, Teresa? that are working to increase yeah. uh, significantly our graduation rates. And we have our first one in for about six weeks now, and she's making a huge impact Good. directly working with those students, directly working with those families. So I really look to see um, some great improvement. We're also having our very first in-person graduation um, here in June, so we're really excited about seeing that and then being able to see kind of the fruits of those initiatives moving forward. I'm always excited to hear about continuous <coughs> improvement, but I will tell you for a virtual school, 75% uh, graduation rate is very, very good. And I'm very proud because I was a 1994 Pearson user in Illinois. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I go way back. It's way better now. Thank you. What was the total students you said? 25. Almost 2,500. Almost 2,500. <laughs> That's grown a lot, too. Yeah. Um, when we are started five years ago. Absolutely. For, for context, the school actually ballooned up to about 3,500 during the pandemic. Oh, and, yeah. And it has settled back, and the projection <coughs> for September 30th is right around that 2,500 number. So they anticipate much. They, they, I think and that's K about, through 12? Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. K through 12. They added about 1,200 in about four months' time. Oh, I and, bet. And now bet. growth is close to about 5% year. <laughs> I bet. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yep. There is a motion. Would somebody like to read that? Or make that motion, Mary? Move to approve the Oxford Community Schools Board of Education resolution approving the reauthorization and the 2023 through 2028 Lighthouse Connections Academy contract as presented. Is there support? Support Heather. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. We'll go back to our regularly scheduled meeting. Funny. And that gives us the uh, Honor Health Grant presentation, Mr. Barlis. Thank you guys. Um, so as we 
revisit the Honor Health Clinic uh, partnership overview. Um, I want to just run through our slides and then answer questions. Uh, our first slide here really references where we started um, back in October of 2021, identifying needs in our community um, for both, uh, well, for, for a school-based health clinic. And that was based on our MiFi data and some other components um, of needs in our community with under-resourced groups um, and demographics within our schools. Uh, at that point is when we started to explore this op opportunity um, through Honor Community Health and accessing a grant through the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. So that was back in October 2021. And we've kind of moved through that process. And last August, we tabled this because there were some construction that needed to be done on a clinic. And um, it was going to be very challenging to complete that construction within a time frame um, with students returning to school and staff in, the mil in those buildings, so, um, or at the high school specifically. Uh, so we are bringing this back, revisiting it tonight. Uh, the purpose of the clinic is really um, stated here. We, we want to address the physical and psychological needs and the safety and well-being of our students throughout the district. Uh, that is a core purpose of a school, the school-based health clinic. Um, the <laughs> clinic being placed at the high school really can serve students 14 years old and up. Um, I did reference the mental health code here and I wanted to really take the time to clarify um, that the legislative language in that mental health code states that we may service those 14 year old and older students without consent from parents. However, as we've discussed with the board at different times, that's a may. Um, as we move forward with the process, uh, my recommendation and as we work with our advisory groups in the community would be that we would request, uh, we would require consent from parents early on in the process and then keep them informed as we move forward. So I did want to make sure that we did have that legislative uh, mental health code in there so that you can review it, but I did also want to clarify that that states that we may service students without consent, not that we must. Uh, going back to that also, and this was a point that I wanted to address, and I did address previously last August, is that Honor Community Health Clinic does not and is not allowed to provide contraceptives or birth control as a health service in that clinic. So I wanted to be very clear with that, as I was last August. That hasn't changed. Um, why, do we, why do we see a need for um, a school-based health clinic at the high school? Um, some of the things that we're looking at as far as some of the benefits medically would be for some of our fragile students that are in the district. Students with medical needs such as asthma, some of those chronic needs around diabetes, seizures. Um, Honor Health Clinic staff can provide the, the training, not only for our staff to support those medical action plans to support those students, but also in educating not only those students but the parents and, and responding when we have issues in our buildings. Uh, I referenced on here that um, we have had first responders at our buildings um, 32 times this school year for minor medical issues. Um, the hope would be that with the support of a school-based health clinic, we could alleviate some of that. Anytime we have a first responder in a building, uh, a, a emergency vehicle outside of our building, it creates anxiety. It can be activating for our community outside in our neighborhoods, as well as for our kids uh, and staff in those buildings. So the hope would be that we'd be able to address some of that from a medical perspective, addressing some of those minor medical issues. Uh, from a mental health perspective, um, I was really looking at, at, wanted to present to you guys some of our spring survey uh, data from 2022. Um, parents and guardians expressed that when accessing supports, the top barriers that they experienced included of not being certain of what they needed around mental health education, um, where they could, could benefit from that, uh, from workshops or trainings. Um, the financial costs, 29% of our family said the financial burden was, was a barrier to accessing services. And wait lists, 25% uh, of our family said they experienced wait lists. Um, in my community-based partnership committee meeting yesterday um, that, that we hold as a district on, on a monthly basis, 
um, Easter Seals reported as one of our community partners that they are currently the only mental health provider in Oakland County accepting referrals right now. All of our other mental health providers are currently at capacity is what Easter Seals had reported at our meeting. Um, so there's a great need out there for our families. That barrier continues to be an issue. It was in 2022 and it's probably grown in 2023. Um, some of the other things as we look at some of our needs in our buildings, as we complete threat assess assessments and suicide assessments in our building, I reference some of that data. Um, at least 41 of our students involved in suicide assessments resulted in referrals for community mental health uh, evaluations due to suspected medium or high risks. And so with us trying to connect our families, when we identify a student who's at either medium or high risk, to a resource in the community, a third party screener perhaps, or an evaluation, um, oftentimes we leave that with our families. And so we'll conduct that assessment and then we give our family the resources to pursue with that child. If they run into a provider that says, sorry, we aren't accepting anybody, or they call say a mobile crisis response team and they say, we aren't staffed today, that family who's in the midst of crisis really has limited resources at that point. Um, my hope would be with a school-based health clinic, we'll have a health navigator who's right there in our building who will be networking in our community. So when we complete one of these assessments, we can walk that family right over to the clinic. They'll sit down with that, that um, community health navigator and they can make that phone call with the parent. So if they run into a barrier or roadblock, they'll have the next resource available. And I think that would be a huge asset to our families that are, that are in the midst of crisis with, with their child. Um, I will say that I did reference some of our co-located treatment services through Easter Seals at both OHS and OMS. Um, we've got one full-time clinician currently. He has been at capacity, I think, since about December. So he currently serves about 61 students, 44 at OHS, 17 at Oxford Middle School. And with that, um, we've really tried to utilize his services as efficiently as possible. We've grouped students where we could and put them in groups where we could service more students to open up individual, um, individual services for those that required individual outpatient services, but he is at capacity. He's actually received 116 referrals this year. That's the most we've utilized our co-located services since we've had our partnership with Easter Seals. So we are really making use of the services that we currently have in our district right now. What to expect? Um, we're, we're looking to provide a certain level of medical services, and that would include dental sealants, vision referrals, mental health services, and referrals. Um, we want direct care for our high school students, um, and, and I want to emphasize for our high school students, so we will not be providing any type of services for community members, anything like that. It will strictly be servicing our high school students that are at Oxford High School. Um, where we will gain benefit for our community is community-based education and outreach. So Honor Health is going to be able to, as a, as a partnership, be able to do some of that trainings that, that those surveys back in 2022 referenced. Parents would like more information around what are some mental health concerns. How do we address depression, anxiety, stressors to our children? How do we, how do we support our kids in these areas? So that community-based education is important. And then I just referenced coordination of student care. Um, that's not only in the clinic, but we did have a, a concern or a constraint back in August when we were discussing this with the board about competing with community-based um, entrepreneurs, providers, and really um, we are providing um, referrals to community providers. So that would include pediatricians, dentists, optometrists, and mental health professionals in our community. And I will speak more to that in, in a little bit as we move forward. Um, so previous concerns addressed. Um, location at the high school. I, I just want to be very transparent. Um, there are concerns about having the clinic near or in the 200 hallway. Um, the objective is that is not even on the table now. We really looked at having the clinic centrally located. Some of the considerations that we, we are looking at is making sure that kids have confidentiality when they go to the clinic so they aren't stigmatized by their peers. We want to protect their dignity and we also want to have a minimal impact with any disruption to other students or to our instructional staff at the high school. So those are considerations we're taking into account with the location of the clinic at the high school. Uh, community services and access, there will be no community services provided or community access to the clinic. That is something that I really wanted to be clear about. That was a previous concern. 
Uh, parent consent. Parent consent is going to be required for all medical and dental services provided at the clinic. I want to make sure that that's clear. Um, students won't. Um, as we develop our policies and procedures, we will clarify that. Um, I went back to the mental health code and, and reviewed the wording of that with you, so we have full latitude in order to, to collect consent forms from parents. Preference would be at the beginning of the year when they're doing their, their arrival packets, just like we do with some other forms, and those consent forms are actually good for four years. Um, in discussions with Honor Health about consent, um, if a student doesn't have consent and they come down and they've just got a splitting migraine or something like that and we don't have a consent on file, Honor Health would automatically contact that parent and say, we have your child here, they came to the clinic, they're experiencing this, do you give their, your verbal consent for us to treat them? And they would be able to do that at that time so they confirm that. Dan, do you have a question? Yes. Um, <clears throat> what if the student's 18? Pardon me? What if the student is 18? They would no longer be a minor, so they would be an Correct. adult. So even if they sign the, the waiver as when they're 16 years old and it's good for four years, it ends at their 18th birthday, correct? They would have, we would have consent and they, they would be considered an adult. Yeah. I just, I'm more concerned about a parent wanting to know if we provided any medical care to somebody yeah. that's 18 years of age, you know, sure. they, they would want to know that and so that's something that we need to consider. Yeah. And I think Honor Health is here tonight, so they're going to do a brief, just a question and answer, and they're going to give a slight overview of what we didn't cover in these slides. However, um, what I'd like to stress is that I was very impressed with their response regarding consent, is that they, their priority is having parents involved. And if they're making referrals and creating um, uh, connections in our community, they need that parent involvement in order to make those networking connections for our families. Um, pregnancy care, education, and family planning, there will be no reproductive services provided at the clinic. That was a concern previously, specifically related to abortion and contraception. Those are the two areas that we were discussing previously. Um, no vaccinations will be provided at the clinic without parental consent, including child well check vac vaccinations or COVID vaccinations. Uh, it was a question that had come up previously. Um, and then competition with community providers. The state actually that is providing this grant through Honor Health, um, an expectation with funding is that the clinic creates pathways to service in our community. And so they make that connection uh, with community providers. So these are a list of staff that Honor Health would be hiring in order to staff the clinic. Uh, that community health worker is that health navigator role that would be making connections for our families that are really trying to navigate those more intensive services for their children uh, in our community when, when needed. A uh, nurse practitioner would be one that could really provide services with supporting that um, our medical action plans for students that have some of those conditions, acute health conditions in our buildings. And this is really a list of um, some of the integrated me medical and mental health care processes that um, would be included in a school-based health model. Again, I would go back and say, um, if you look at the bottom, that is referencing some of the barriers that some of our families reported in the spring survey of 2022. And here, we've got um, opportunities for community and stakeholder communication involvement. So um, the, I really want to stress the fact that um, after the board presentation, board action, we'll be looking at a community advisory council to work um, through the processes and procedures to get community input. Uh, that will include parents, teachers, community, and honor community health staff. Uh, they use a youth advisory council, um, which includes students, um, a health education forum. So they'll conduct forums with our families to gather information exact fr from our family uh, stakeholders. And then they'll do some family education nights and workshops. That isn't something that they're just doing here. That's part of their school-based health model. That's how they launch school-based health clinics uh, across the state where they have, have clinics in, in schools. So with that, I'm gonna bring up our Honor Health uh, representatives. Jeff Cook is the Chief of Community Services and Rosa Thomas, who actually started this work back in, Oct in October of 2021 uh, with Oxford Community Schools as a Chief, Chief Operating Officer, so. 
while, while they're walking up, and maybe you can answer if they're one of the ones that can answer better. So sure. the previous concerns addressed, yeah. um, are those, is that part of the policy that we're coming to an agreement with, with the clinic? How, how I mean, it's written down here, right? But mm -hmm. how are those really addressed? Um, I'm trying, I mean, I, it might be different per, per but for instance, I mean, you said that we it's have, the culture for parental consent yeah. is that all, it's going to, it's going it, to, it's, there's a may right in there, but we're going to focus on the parental consent. How is that agreement? What, what is that agreement? We actually will, we have a base interagency agreement that lays out all of those details. And so we've, we've had the draft that we had back last August that was kind of mocked up and attorneys had looked at it on both sides and they've actually, we're, we're including a number of these other topics in a current one. So as we move forward, that interagency agreement will dictate a lot of this and they might be able to reference either Jeff or Rosa how other clinics have done that as far as, as capturing that. Um, I believe there were some questions about that. I might have spoken to that in a response to some of those board questions that came out previously as well, Mike. But, um, yeah. Jeff, hi. Hi, thank you, board members, for uh, having us. Uh, again, my name is Jeff Cook. So I am the uh, Chief of Community Services. Uh, <clears throat> I've been with Honor for uh, six weeks. And uh, prior to that, uh, I ran 16 school-based health centers through Beaumont. So um, currently through Honor, we have 11 school-based health centers. Um, and um, if this will get approved, it'll be number 12. So, um, and then also I have Rosa Thomas with me. She's our chief uh, operating officer and um, she's a psychologist by trade. A lot of great mental health experience. Uh, she was actually here during the tragedy providing um, support to students and, and family members. So. Um, Again, thank you so much for having us. I'd be happy to answer any questions related to any of the services um, associated with the clinic. Uh, the interagency agreement that Todd um, referenced, um, it is a very involved agreement that outlines uh, every single service that we can offer and will provide. Um, it, go, it will list the um, responsibilities of the district um, in terms of space, um, services that you guys will provide and then um, what we'll provide and then there'll be some joint responsibilities uh, in terms of servicing the students and the families um, and that will be um, I will have um, a revised copy to Todd probably tomorrow so um, that will be um, presented to you either through Todd or I can present it to and uh, that will be approved by the board um, before even moving forward. That agreement is very important that everybody's aware of um, what, you know, what we can and can't do. So any questions on, um, from my end? Amanda. Before that interagency agreement, is that for the lifetime of the clinic or can that be changed on a yearly basis? And who would be involved in that? Would it be a collaboration that honor OCS, would the board be involved? Would yeah. the community be involved? Yep. Yeah. Can you Great. explain that a little bit? Great question. So um, that is that agreement can be changed at any point, um, and it has to be um, it has to be approved by our C, uh, CEO of Honor, and it has to be approved by the board. So we do require the state of Michigan. Our NDHHS requires that um, that. Honor CEO sign it as well as the superintendent <coughs> and as well as um, we have to get board approval so the state provides an option for us to um, for the uh, board chairperson or the board president to sign uh, on behalf of the school board and it, we have to show proof of meeting minutes that the school board approved it um, the agreement length really is up to um, up to you guys uh, we can we have the option to have a start date. We have an option for it to be automatically renewed every year um, We have an option for, for you guys to you know review it and renew it every Every other year it, the terms are really based on what you guys prefer um, Also for it to be changed it can be changed it can be reviewed at any time 
uh, it also can be discontinued at any time by either party. So let's say you approve it and after two years, just not working out, all you have to do is give a 30 day notice, uh, no reason at all, um, and then you know that will be discontinued. So there is an out um, on either party. So let's say it isn't working out for honor for some reason, you know, either party can um, cancel that contract with a 30 day notice. Heather. So I don't know if this is, so g give me some examples, even if you're there you're, from your Beaumont experience, because I know you've only been with Honor for a couple yeah. of weeks. Um, like, I, I would need to kind of see how this is really going to roll out. Like, give me an example of somewhere around here where you, you, where you guys did a Beaumont clinic in a district similar to ours with yeah. our demographics and student count and staff count. And yeah. Well, currently through Honor, um, we have clinics inside. We have so we have three in Pontiac, uh, we have one in um, Waterford, and then we have a full clinic in Auburn Hills. <coughs> so that's that's our five that we have through Honor, and then we have um, what we call a um, E3 um, empowerment zone, um, and those are where we just employ a full-time mental health therapist. Uh, no medical services, um, it's just mental health. And um, we have two and three in Pontiac. Uh, we have one in Rochester, one in Rotterford, uh, one in Waterford. Uh, actually two, sorry, two in Rochester, and then one in Ferndale. Where are um, your Rochester ones? Do you mind me asking? Um, it's at Rochester High School and Hart Middle School. And that's just mental <coughs> health only. Through Beaumont, um, we had full clinics in, uh, I, I'm going to try to remember all these, um, we actually had eight of them. Um, so we have one at John Glenn High School in Westland. Uh, we have one in Inkster, uh, in a middle school in Inkster. Uh, we had uh, two in Taylor, uh, one in River Rouge High School, uh, one in Romulus High School. And then one in um, Westland and Middle School. Those are school. full clinics, like you guys are talking about wanting to do here. Exact, exactly the same. Yeah. Is the Auburn Hills site a full clinic? It is. And it's at Avondale, it? Avondale High School. Avondale High School. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very busy clinic. So, yeah. So it's exactly the same. Same exact minimum requirements. Same exact services. Uh, same exact, um, really, interagency agreement, you know, there's some um, must-haves in that agreement, so it's um, exactly the same. The only difference is, um, that would be different here, is just servicing the high school students here. The other clinics, they do open it up to community members, um, and what I found is kids um, can be so transient in terms of moving around these days. Um, but that would be the only difference between the uh, wellness clinic here. I'd, I'd probably want to have to go see one of those. Yeah, I think yeah. Avondale would be a good one too. Yeah. Yeah, you're so welcome. Um, mm -hmm. I'd be happy to give you guys a tour. Okay. For sure. Uh -oh. And then meet the staff too. So. Okay. Are staff being serviced at this clinic too? Should they have yes. the option? Uh, our staff. Pardon me? Our staff. I think it was your question. Yeah. Is our staff able to be serviced at the clinic? Um, no. So um, it is limited to ages 5 to 21 and up to age 26 for special ed. So that's for direct service inside the clinic. Um, in terms of education, outreach, training, um, awareness, um, we do provide education trainings, um, for example, mental health prevention to teachers, staff, um, parents if they would like it. Um, so those health education sessions can be provided and will be provided and offered to um, every single staff member if they would you know, like to receive it. But in terms of direct service, like um, immunizations, it's just ages 5 to 21 and then up to 26 for special ed students. So. What about our what about our school population that is of, uh, is of the high school age? I'm thinking along the lines of um, our OVA students. Could they come into the high school and, and get services? Um, if they're if they're 21 and under, okay. um, 
and if they're not a student of no, they would be a student or? they're all uh, they're all oh, yeah. students of oxford sure yeah they could come just i'm, I'm just thinking of the students that are not in the building in they right. would have to come through the office just like they were visiting that campus that that would be your option okay right and and really so this grant is really flexible you know it's it's up to the school board uh, it's up to the principal for you guys to decide who comes to the clinic. Um, we have, you know, all of our clinics, like for example, in my, my clinic through Beaumont, all except one serviced, um, as long as you lived in Wayne County, you could utilize the clinic. Um, some, some will just say those who live in the district, uh, those who attend school in the district, uh, we have some schools where, um, some districts where, you know, it doesn't matter where you go to school in the district, you can utilize services at the clinic. So whether you would, um, go to an elementary school, middle school, high school, you could utilize that clinic. So it's totally up to you guys. Okay. I have another question. Um, what about um, if we're going to be referring out to different providers? Yeah what is the vetting process that that provider needs to to go through in order to become somebody that we're going to refer yeah. our students out to yeah um it, it's wide open so it's ba it's basically up to the family they can choose their provider so it's up to the student up to the parent um, if we um, through a physical exam maybe um, there's some indication of maybe heart issues then um, we work with the family to determine where they want to be referred to. So a cardiologist, um, it's, you know, we like to stay local, you know, and for, out of convenience and, um, you know, really out of the convenience for the family. But it's really up to the family to, to kind of pick where that referral. Um, so we work closely with that student, that family to refer out. Because insurances are all, kind of all over the board well you need a referral for this you need a referral for that right you don't you do so it's very confusing yeah and, and especially when you're in a, in a situation where you have a medical need it just becomes your focus is on your student and your right. child yeah. but I think the other thing that I want I, more reason the, the more pointed part of my question is is I know this isn't a Beaumont facility but I'm going to use the phrase right I don't want anybody just to be referred to a quote-unquote Beaumont doctor or a doctor that's sure. in their network you're right I think it I'm glad that it's open. It's wide open. Okay. Actually, whatever you know, whatever insurance. So we have community health workers that we work with. They specialize in follow up. They specialize in referrals. Uh, they specialize in a lot of stuff. So um, our staff will work closely. Whatever insurance. Let's say you know. Let's say a provider doesn't accept maybe a Medicaid plan. Then we'll find one that does. So okay. we'll work closely with the family with a network of providers um, to, you know, to be available to that family. Uh, we are also, um, you know, very aware of um, if they, um, if they don't have an opportunity, if we, you know, if there are a set of providers that, you know, aren't accepting patients, then obviously we're not going to refer that person. Okay. So we'll, you know, we'll make sure our staff, they're knowledgeable in terms of the, the best providers to recommend. But ultimately, is it up? It is up to the family member, and we yeah. we can assist them in determining. We can look up their insurance if they have insurance. Uh, if they don't have insurance, then we can even um, assist them in signing up and applying for a Medicaid health plan. Uh, so we have uh, navigators that specialize in uh, the Medicaid health plans. Uh, they go through trainings, and um, if they don't, um, if they don't. Um, qualify for a Medicaid health plan because let's say they are um, not of age or they make too much money, then we'll still provide that service. Um, none of the patients and the family members will ever get a bill. So let's say they um, come to the uh, wellness center and they receive services uh, and they can't uh, afford a copay or even if they don't want to pay the copay, we waive it and we still provide the service and that's per our grant requirements. Also, um, if they have a balance um, you know, based on a deductible or out-of-pocket cost, um, we will waive that. You know, and that is part of our grant requirements too because the state, um, our Child and Adolescent Health Division, they say that absolutely no barriers to care will be in play 
at the clinic. Okay. So we, we follow that. Okay, very good. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Amanda? I have a couple more, actually. So going back to, to the consent, you had spoken about having a consent form that was good for, for four years. Is that going to be sort of a blanket consent? So if they, if a student were to come in for you know a headache, they wouldn't have to call the parent to have Tylenol, but then if the next week, if it was um, maybe to, to talk about mental health or something different, right. is that initial consent good for whatever the child walks into for the next four years? Yeah, so um, the providers, both mental health and medical, um, they will use their own professional judgment if it's a if it's a bruise, if it's a headache, um, you know, if they come in with ongoing headaches, they're going to call the parent. You know, um, if they come in with ongoing um, issues with anxiety and it progresses to, you know, maybe some thoughts of harming themselves, or obviously that's very serious, and we would you know activate our emergency protocol, but. Um, it would just depend on the seriousness of the issue, if there's a pattern, if the student keeps on coming in with a stomach ache, you know, um, obviously there could be some tests that the provider recommends. So that consent, you know, we always err on the side of safety. The only reason we have that policy in place for it's good for four years is because it allows us, you know, like I said, if we don't have consent, you know, we don't treat, so um, we can't perform that physical. We can't provide that Tylenol unless we have consent. Um, Can I piggyback off that? Yeah. Uh, real quick. So do you have an electronic medical record that has a patient portal that parents could access and see visit summaries like we all do when we go to primary care doctors? Right. Yeah, very good question. So we do have a, it's called NextGen. Um, any sensitive, uh, material like mental health, um, the, the parents will not it, have access. I'm talking medical only right now. Yeah, you know, medical. Yeah, if it's a sensitive issue, um, uh, kind of like a confidential issue, then the parent will not have access. So that will be flagged. So, um, and, and students, actually minors do have a right mm -hmm. not to consent to release their medical records, you know, and we have a full policy on that. Uh, that's one of our policies that our advisory board members that we set up will have to review and approve. So um, any sensitive related issue, any abuse, let's say there, you know, maybe a student comes to the clinic and, um, you know, complains of abuse by a parent, you know, the fact that we get Child Protective Services involved and any of that information um, will not be released to the parent. The parent will not have access to that portal. Uh, the parent will not have access to that information. So, if, um, the, uh, if the parent signs the uh, release for four days, the consent, four years, the consent, yeah. do they have an ability to come back in another year and withdraw it? They, they do. That's a good question. Um, yes. So any parent has the ability to revoke a consent. The only thing they would have to do is sign the consent that they um, discontinue or revoke it, date it, and we'll put that on file. And so we will not have the ability to see that student um, unless it's an emergency. So if it's, if it's life-threatening, um, you know, even inside the school, um, let's say, a student, um, we don't have consent on a student, and um, they're a minor, um, or even if they're you know 18 or over, and if their life is being threatened, let's say they fall, crack their head open, um, let's say they're having an asthma attack and they can't breathe, then um, we will provide that service to save their life, you know, and and we don't need consent. Um, consent goes out the window when it's life threatening. But yeah, they do have the ability to revoke that consent at any time uh, for any reason, you know, and uh, and unless it's life-threatening, we will not see that student, so. Okay. Amanda, you had multiple yep. questions, so. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. That's I okay. Get, I won't get into all of them tonight. Right. Um, but just a couple quick more I want to reiterate. So the clinic will be covered by immunity, correct? So any malpractice or medical error claim 
will be covered under governmental Hi. immunity? Yes. Okay. Yes, 100 percent. Any services from that clinic were 100 percent covered, and and you know no liability for the district. Zero liability. Okay. Uh, great. And then uh, as far as I, I did ask this question and, and got somewhat of a response, so maybe you could send us a little bit more information on the procedures in place that you have to identify and prevent medical errors yes. uh, so that we can kind of take a closer look sure. at what policies and procedures you have in place. Yep. Yeah, we have a full quality assurance uh, policy. We have a quality assurance committee that meets monthly. Um, we have two physicians that lead that and we go over um, any incident reports which includes any medical reports that come in through any of our school-based sites. Um, we have incident reporting that we go through each incident report. Um, by policy, we're required to create an action plan. So um, let's say, you know, let's say we have a slip and fall in one of our clinics and there was a um, puddle of water. You know, we have to go through this comprehensive risk assessment with our risk manager to um, avoid those problems in the future. Um, this committee is made up of nurses, physicians, um, Rosa from the mental health side, uh, myself. We have um, our risk and compliance um, director. So there's probably about 15 people that serve on this committee. And then on top of that, we're required to have um, a quality assurance subcommittee at each clinic. So um, if we were to get one here at Oxford, we would have an interdisciplinary quality committee made up of our um, physician assistant or our nurse practitioner, our uh, master level therapist, our community health worker, our medical assistant. Um, I would be the lead in this committee. Um, and then we um, talk about policies, we talk about all of our chart reviews. Uh, we do quarterly chart reviews um, on each provider. Um, we pick a um, special project that we're required to focus on to improve uh, every year. Um, we would present that to our community advisory committees as well as our um, youth advisory committees. Um, it's a, a plan, do, steady act um, where we um, identify maybe something that we need to improve upon. Could be patient satisfaction scores. Um, it could be um, our quality outcomes linked to our work plan with our grant. Um, and then we meet on a quarterly basis um, to review that. Actually, we meet on a monthly basis because we involve our um, that in our staff meetings every month. So, okay. but I can provide that policy for you guys to review if you want. That would be okay. excellent. Thank Great. you. I'll stop I, I, I do. Sorry. Yeah. Um, just a couple clarifying points. So I wasn't on the board when you guys first presented, so I'm trying to get caught up just so you guys know. Um, the timeline that, um, say we vote on it at the next meeting, it gets approved. What's the timeline to the community advisory committees, the other committees, and then the actual launch? Would that be, just so I'm clear, next academic year? Yeah, good question. So um, if you were to approve this um, at the end of the month, um, we would get a, our first and first thing we would do is form a community advisory committee. Um, and it consists of um, parents, um, school staff, um, it could uh, involve, it will involve students. Um, anybody who really takes ownership and takes an interest in adolescent health. Um, so, um, one third, so 33% of the committee has to be made up of parents of, of um, youth age. So um, parents that have children ages five to 21. Um, and then it'll include, um, it can include some hospital or some healthcare staff. Um, so anybody who, who really shows a passion for adolescent health, um, that would be the first thing we do because we would really formulate a plan to um, develop um, announcements. You know, we want to make sure that we get input um, not only from the community advisory committee, but you know, those stakeholders in the school. You know, not everybody in the school in the district will be able to be on the committee, so we want to make sure we get input. And then implementation. Um, you know, we would work closely with the superintendent and Todd in terms of uh, developing some um, bids for construction, renovation. 
Um, we would work with your architectural company to determine a timeline, and um, those timelines may vary. Um, usually a full build out, you know, most likely, especially with the coming out of a pandemic, uh, it could take, you know, could take up to five, six months. Um, so what we would do is we would coordinate ordering all of our medical supplies um, and, and all of our medical equipment, exam tables, furniture, desks, all that will be covered by the grant. You know, so um, we will order those. And then in terms of opening, um, the state, um, since this was put on hold once, the state kind of expects us to be up and running, maybe not all full services, but you know, they give us they gave us a timeline of of January two thousand twenty four. They would like to see most services, you know, provided. So, okay. um, and of course, that is flexible. It, it it's based on supplies. You know, they, we know that there could be some supplies and uh, or some delays in getting supplies, um, some building supplies and stuff like that. So. Any further questions? If I can just add that the critical timeline here is, of course, the construction because if we can get that done prior to school starting, it's least disruptive to the students. It's not that we couldn't do some of the construction after kids were there, mm -hmm. but if we could get the majority of it done, then it's less. Uh, so that's why we're saying, you know, if you approve August 25th, we've still got to put out the RFP, we've got to get bids from contractors, there's things we have to do in the hopes that someone could start construction in June. That would be the hope. Do we have a location? Pardon? Do we have an identified location yet? Well, we're looking at, we're looking at a, a couple of classrooms in the center of the building that look like they would accommodate this well. Uh, certainly before you meet on the 25th, we would be able to have that location selected and we would be able to get to you some of the um, diagrams of what we thought it might it might look like a couple of options uh, right now so, tonight we don't have that selection but probably Todd I think we were talking about in, a, in another week we might be able to tie that down <coughs> and, and get the right people uh, involved in the in the decision and so the exclusion of community from the previous conversation to just include high school students <coughs> negates every other student in every other building that this grant could qualify? Well, again, that's up to you guys. Um, we have the ability to serve anybody between the ages 21. of 5 to 21 and up to 26 for special ed. So if, um, if, if you guys decide to serve the middle school students and they could come over, um, our our hours of operation um, usually we start when school starts you know so we could start whenever um, students are in session and then we do have the ability to extend our hours to meet the needs of your students um, again that would be up up to you we could <coughs> we could just limit it to high school students you could open it up um, again I think um, as Todd referenced, you know, our, our first and foremost would be um, safety. You know, absolutely no community members will have access. Um, how that plays out with other students in the district and parents bringing them over, you know, um, could formulate a plan to do that. My, my staff will be flexible, you know. Um, I have sites where um, we, we provide a late night, you know, uh, to um, the family members who work late. So um, some of my sites, we're open till 7 p.m. Um, if that's the case, we, we will just have a shorter day, like maybe on a Friday we would, you know, have to close up the clinic. Uh, I can't work my staff more than 40 hours, so we would have to kind of balance that. But I understand that. I just want to make sure, since I wasn't at the previous yeah. table, that the clear understanding is that if we limit it to just high school students at Oxford High School, that precludes bringing in others, and that is a decision that has to be made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's correct. Gotcha. And that because it's just for students. Just for yep, just for students. Got it. And that can, that can be changed. We could we could change that agreement. Um, it's it's totally up to the board. Okay. And we appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? So I just want to be clear. So this isn't a, a build out or a build on to our 
building we're going to find room inside our building yes I, I thought we were already kind of maxed out well so how are we going to so how are we going to find room for this so when, like, we locked have, and other places we have, are scrunched well we have located a couple of options that requires minimal staff move around you need to give us just a few more days so that we can talk to staff that would be involved to kind of finalize the plan uh, we can get that information to you through you know an update at the end of this week but we need to give Daisha and her staff time to be able to look at and discuss the options that we found and then once everybody's in, informed at the high school then I'll be able to get that information out to all of you another couple of days is probably what we need and I can explain to you how the space is coming about and what if anything is getting displaced and and all of the details but uh, at this point it's just we have a couple of options and we're still trying to figure out which would be the best and then we have to talk to the people involved the um, and I can provide you with what we need as a minimum in the clinic um, you know for example we we absolutely have to have two exam rooms and you know the exam rooms you know can be like nine by twelve feet so um, I can give you all the really the requirements you know in terms of needing you know we really recommend having three exam rooms because I do anticipate um, a lot of need you know for students uh, we have to have a, a mental health therapist office to provide therapy we have to have a, kind of a, a lab area a waiting room reception a bathroom um, kind of a, a meeting room for our community or our um, youth advisory council and our community advisory council to meet so i can give you some of those bare minimums um, that will you know should be able to fit in the space what and what is our, what is our own um I, I know that we've done a lot of hiring for our mental health staff what what is our count at for the high school i i would want to know that like how many fsls do we have how many counselors do we have how many um restorative practices coordinators do we have how many you know um how many of our own staff we you know we want to give them job security too that's their job that's what we hire them to do it's the mental health people right yeah because we have no medical but you're talking about right i'm talking about mental health because that's what okay. they keep talking about but we just hired a whole bunch of people that are oxford community employees <laughs> The, the difference would be is the level of care, Heather. So um, th this is actually a clinic based, and so they're providing treatment services similar to what you would receive in a community based clinic. So our mental health staff provide school based interventions as part of a multi tiered framework. And so they'll provide four to six week interventions based on data and kind of measure a student's response. But when students don't respond to that tier two, that short term intervention, or even a tier three one on one intervention, that's where you run into that next level of care, which is treatment. And so being able to make those referrals, as I referenced early in the presentation, across Oakland County, as was reported to Research Seals yesterday, they are the only mental health provider currently accepting referrals. Everyone else is, is at their capacity. So it's that next level of care, which typically in a school public school-based model, we don't provide treatment in a school. We provide interventions as part of a tiered framework. So. Um, Jeff might be able to expand further on what they do provide around that. But. So um, we have to we have to uh, provide the state an assurance that nothing will be supplanted. So um, there's no way, shape, or and the state will check this. Um, that you know we have to we have to guarantee that no current school service will be eliminated. So. Um, you know they want the state want to make sure that we add to services not supplant any services so it's not like any any therapist any counselor any social worker that you have hired right now um, they they cannot be laid off because we're coming in and and so that's a guarantee um, that we have to provide the state kind of like Todd said we're doing evidence-based um, cognitive behavioral therapy solution-based therapy it's it is a clinical program um, that we're providing so it's just like you you know anybody that will walk into a, a mental health agency and ask for um, assessment and therapy that's what we're going to be doing which is much different than 
um, social work. And maybe Rosa can expound on that. To my size, I guess. <laughs> Thank you very much for having us today. As um, you know, in the continuum of care, if you look at it at the system of care, not every child that comes into our service is going to need the same service. Like your school, uh, look at school psychologists, they may be doing testing to look at cognitive impairment, learning disabilities, and so on. In the clinics that we're having, we're having the children that come in. Just to tell you, they come in and they said, I'm really having a stomach ache. The next day I come back, I have a stomach ache. The next day I come back and I said, well, you know, it's something else going on. And our clinician is gonna say, okay, let's get the mental health person here. And then we discover that this child is having some issues and it's anxiety mixed with something else. <coughs> so that kind of thing, we could look into the clinic, maybe three, four sessions, we could talk to the child, do some breathing exercises, but then, if the child said, I have been abused, and I have all this trauma, and I have brothers and sisters that need more, we're gonna go to the next level of care. We're gonna have to say, okay, we need home-based services, and I happened that I was a home-based therapist for a while, so I went to the homes. That required two to three hours a week to work with the whole family to bring them in. So those are the things that we are looking at. We are looking at how we refer uh, the individual, how we work with the family. Are these individuals need a little bit more? Do they need Spanish speaking? We have a big population, sometimes it's Spanish speaking. We had a contract with the Central La Familia that we could provide that because translating in therapy, let me tell you, it doesn't work, yeah. right? Because my native language is that too. And I, I hear the translations and the translations are like, no, that is not what this person is saying. And it's not her history, it's not what we want. So our clinic is looking, if you look at it, look it up like a center that you come with an airplane and we're saying, this is where the destination is. Sometimes the destination is where we are and we could provide those services, but we are not the higher service either. So if a child come in and is suicidal, and homicidal, we're gonna be triggering a phone call to the parent, to common ground, to get the assessment, make sure that that person get that service, get there. Because how many of us know how to get where we need to go, right? So our, our job is to get that community health worker to make sure that tells that parent, this is what you could do. You, when you have a problem as a parent and your child is in crisis, you're not thinking what I need to do. You need that extra help with that community health worker saying, let me make the phone calls for you. Let me make the appointments. Let me guide you. Your insurance doesn't cover this, but we could get this. And also, in, we have a full center in Pontiac High School. We have half children that are homeless, that people didn't know that they are going couch to couch. And then the center could identify <coughs> them. But those children only have that ability because the school have the center and they have access. So we're an access point to really put the child where they need to. And really for me, and I, I was uh, honored to come and help during the time of need. And we were standing up there and people would come and talk to us, right? Because we knew, they knew we were therapists, we were mental health workers. We were a hearing ear. Not everybody gonna need the higher level, but if we don't catch them when they are at that lower level, it's gonna become worse. So that is what the center does, and we have one in Pontiac, like I said. We have, in that population, we have a lot of people that have other needs, and mainly are housing, and we were able to get housing for the families and them with the child. But the child was that came and told us, my family is homeless. And so that's the another piece that we see. So uh, this is not a center for everything. We don't do everything. We do the referrals. Look at us like this, you know, air traffic control, right? And we're moving people from one place to another. So um, you have any other questions about mental health? I would like to. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. <coughs> Okay.
think we've got quite a bit of information. Yeah, I think we have like a lot of questions that were brought to the table. Uh, I'm glad to see that we've took a look at where we were at before, mm -hmm. made some adjustments. Those adjustments are, I think, our community was, you know, um, I think some of the board members too were a little concerned, myself included, about mm -hmm. people coming in from the outside, especially right now. So yeah. um, I'm, I'm glad that we that it was heard and it was taken into consideration. Can I add one yes, ma'am. Um, when we were working, the grant was given a year ago. Mm -hmm. So um, what we heard from the community is that we weren't ready to spend this fund. The fund, I talked to the state of Michigan, the state of Michigan said we will do whatever the community wants to do. And so they put a hole in this grant. So I want you to know that we will work with whatever you need to do, and the state was more than happy to make all the arrangements, all the, the changes that it need to be so that the community feels safe. Mm -hmm. So that was, uh, and when I talked to them last, and before my colleagues take over that piece, it was the, still the same thing, that okay. they're going to do what they need to do. So I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so the grant has been very accommodating through Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and very flexible with us from the utilization of funds to actually what our community feels that they need or can't, can't have at this time. So um, I, you know, I'm very, gr have gratitude towards them for that. Um, and I look forward to, you know, being able to answer you guys' questions and move it forward. Is there, next week, a visit to Avondale. It, do we know who would like to go, or do you guys want to reach out to me with dates and times? Yeah, so that I think that whoever wants to go needs to get with, mm -hmm. with uh, myself Todd. and Vicki, perhaps. And yep. What kind of coordinate? Groups of three, right? Part yeah. Of, we well, of three you can be together three. as long as you're not like deliberating. Right? Correct. Um, mm -hmm. We can go to a function we'll, together. Yeah. Okay. We won't be and deliberating. Tom will handle I'm out of town next week. Okay. Yeah. So if you reach out to me, I will coordinate a couple different times with Avondale and try to get us over there so that we can get a look at the clinic. Let's okay. try to get to Todd by the end of this week, yeah. if you can make it, because we're compressing that time, yeah. not just for us, but for them as well. Thank I, you. I did have a comment. Um, yes. And I just wanted to share, I, I, I think that, I think that this clinic can offer a lot of services that um, <laughs> maybe a lot of us just don't see um, because we're not in that space. Um, we were talking about people who don't um, use English as their first language. Um, and, and there's a lot of people in our community um, whose Spanish is a first language for, but we don't necessarily um, see them as much because they don't necessarily know how to access some of these things. We have people in our community, we have children who are unhoused in this community. You know, we have people without insurance. We have people who are um, working hourly jobs and can't take time off work to get their kids to the doctor. Um, we have families on Medicaid who have no idea how to even start the phone calling process when it comes to getting services for their kids. And I just think that, um, I just think we need to think long and hard about this because if we are, um, if we want to provide services to every student, um, we have to think about the ones that we are not seeing. That's all. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Okay. We're good. All right. All right. Thank, thank you, you, Todd. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Item D. Guidepost presentation. Good evening. Hello. Hello. Give me one second. For those of you I've not met yet, good evening. My name is Bradley Dizick. I'm an executive vice president at the consulting firm Guidepost Solutions. I am pleased to report that our investigation is close to completion. 
and that we are transitioned for the most part to report writing. We still have about two or three interviews that we're going to finish up this month. Um, one for a critical witness who is represented by counsel. Um, and we're going to do some final testing on some of the security controls over the next week or two. We have reached out to all of the plaintiff's attorneys to give everyone who is a victim or the family of a victim the last opportunity to meet with us. We have had over 60% of the victims and the victim's families sit down with us. And those who have not yet, we wanted to make sure that they had that final opportunity. As an initial matter, we expect that our first report will be released publicly in the next few weeks. This report will be released to you, the board, at the same time as it is released to the public. Our first report will document the district's current security and threat assessment pr uh, program <coughs> and practices. We have reviewed all policies, procedures, and practices. We have sat in on trainings. We have spoken with people on the threat assessment teams people who are involved with your security on a daily basis. Um, and a review will be comprehensive and the report will be as well. It will document a lot of good practices, others that may be excessive and unneeded going forward, and places where improvement can be made. After this first report is released and at the request of this board for community listening sessions, we will host a community forum to answer questions about our first report for the Oxford community and the public. The date and, and format for this community forum is to be determined, but will most likely be in May. Back in November 2022, we announced that our first report would be released in January 2023. However, shortly after that announcement, Superintendent, former Superintendent Weaver announced his resignation. Additionally, we learned shortly after that as a final act before announcing his resignation, Mr. Weaver hired a new director of operations who is now responsible for the district security and threat assessments. Various new security policies, emergency operating plans, and related technology have been implemented, thereby significantly changing the district's security posture. This new director of operations, with the support of Dr. Markovich and this board, has also provided us with a level of transparency and access that we did not previously receive. Beginning in the winter with the election of Dan D'Alessandro as president and the appointment of Dr. Vicki Markovich as superintendent, we experienced more voluntary cooperation from school employees, including those represented by council. Because of these considerations, a decision was made to report to the community on what is now and will be in place going forward rather than document and report on security and threat assessment programs and practices that were interim and no longer applicable. In preparing the second report, which will include the findings of our independent investigation, we have been in frequent contact with the Oakland County Prosecutor's Office. The Prosecutor's Office has provided guideposts with significant detailed information relating to the incident. That information is critical to the review, and some portions of that information are still non-public. As a condition of receiving that information, Guidepost agreed that it would not divulge any non-public information until such time as the prosecutor was comfortable that disclosure would not impact the Miller hearing, which I believe is in two weeks. It was June, July. June 2nd now? It just got July. July. It was July. So the, so, the, so the Miller <clears throat> hearing for the shooter or the criminal trial of the Crumbleys. Guidepost will continue regular communication with the prosecutor's office to determine when and how we can issue our second report on the incident without impacting the criminal cases. Hopefully our working relationship with the prosecutor's office will serve as a national example for how communities, subject matter experts, law enforcement and prosecutors can work together and collaborate to find factual truths and identify learnings from tragedies like the one here in Oxford. In addition to the o Oakland County Prosecutor, the Oakland County Executive, Oakland County Corporation Council, and Oakland County Sheriff provided us with complete transparency, producing all evidence and making available to us every person we asked to interview 
which includes in individuals who are now retired and had no requirement to sit down and meet with us. As alluded to above, beginning in the winter, we experienced more voluntary cooperation from school, administration, school administrators and employees, including those represented by council. Although voluntary cooperation remains imperfect, with the support of Dr. Markovich and the advocacy of President D'Alessandro, voluntary cooperation has been substantial. However, several current and former school employees who are critical witnesses have declined to participate, most on the advice of counsel. <coughs> Putting aside the significant difficulties we have encountered with cooperation, and although imperfect, we do have prior statements for some of them, including court transcripts, and statements made to law enforcement the day of the incident. <coughs> Witness accounts, extensive factual discovery, including access to communications, to help us provide the community and public with a comprehensive factual report of what happened before, on, and after November 30th, 2021. To sum up, our first report will, re will be released in the coming weeks. And our second report will be released after consultation with the prosecutor's office to determine when and how we can issue the report without impacting the criminal cases. Both reports will be comprehensive and include recommendations. Both reports will be released to the board at the same time they are released to the public. That concludes my remarks. Thank you, Brad. Just a question. So at the beginning, you I had talked about the community forums possibly starting in May. Can, can you clarify? Just for the, you know, there's a difference of population. Some folks can come during the day, some at night, some only on weekends. Will there be multiple um, community forums? Because I think you may need to do just at least two. If just one would, I think, be insufficient. We're, we're happy to do that. Thank you, Aaron. Any other questions? Okay. Um, Brad Guypost, uh, thank you very much for the update. I know that um, we all, as a board, this community has had um, a lot of questions, but um, it's important that we get quality and not expedience. And I know that's not gonna sit well with a lot of folks, um, but we want, we want quality and we want as, as many answers as we can possibly get. We owe it to this community. So thank you. Thank you. And I think just, um, I was just looking up the date, I believe the Miller hearing is now July, just so, for your So just awareness. to clarify, that does not mean a report will not be re re released before that. There may be certain non-public information that, for example, may be redacted. That's to be determined. I'm not stating that's the way, the approach or the method that we will take, but we're still working with the prosecutor's office on how that information can and will be shared with the community. But that does not mean uh, that second report will not come out until after the Miller hearing or the Crumley's trial uh, concludes. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Yeah, I have a question. Yes, Amanda. Uh, so in your original proposal under task uh, number three, community engagement, you had stated that you will hold community listening sessions to understand security concerns and priorities of the community. This includes town halls, focus groups, and other <clears throat> excuse me, relevant stakeholders who would like a voice in the process. Can you please tell us how many of these events you have scheduled in the past and when and when will they be scheduled in the future? We have, made, we have met, as I stated, with a number of members of the community. We've also met with victims and victims' family. Um, we have not had a large town hall community forum. I believe a decision was made um, last June or July uh, by the district and the district's council not to do that for various reasons that I do not recall. Uh, but we, that was not moved forward with in terms of the town hall. Uh, but we have provided general access to anyone who wanted to come meet with us um, and speak with us, share their perspective, share their viewpoint. And we have met um, with a significant number of people from the community, um, as well as victims and victims' families. Okay, thank you. And then, I'm assuming you can't probably speak to 
Will there be another update, for example, if you talk to the prosecutor and you are able to give us a little bit more information as far as a, a timeline? Do you expect to come back and, and update us accordingly? Yeah. Whenever, whenever um, we're requested to provide an update or there is a material information to share as an update, we're, we're happy to do so. You know, as I stated, we'll probably be back in May, which is just you know, three, four weeks away, um, to host those community events uh, to discuss the first report. So if there's material information to share at that point, um, um, in addition to what we're sharing this evening, we're happy to um, provide an additional update. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And if, if I'm not mistaken, from what I understood, if, if I, what I can recall, was there was the opportunity for anybody that wanted to partake in sitting down with Guidepost to go on a website and, and make that connection. Correct. So there it may not have been a community forum, but there were avenues in order for that to happen. Right. I, I think the decision was made instead of having you know a large town hall, excuse me, a large town hall event with security concerns that we would focus more on one on one interactions and small focus groups. Um, and we did, and, and we had dozens and dozens of those. Um, so there was no limit in terms of who interacted with us. Our, we're still here if people want to sit down with us, meet with us, um, share their perspective. You know, part of this process is listening. That's the only way you're going to get buy-in from the community. That's the only way you're going to help the community heal. Um, we strongly encourage everyone to reach out to us. Um, you know, we're happy to sit down with them. We have trauma-informed folks um, who can sit down with them, meet with them, listen to them, um, hear their thoughts, their concerns. Um, you know, that's part of the process, and we're happy to do it. Any other questions? Coming weeks means one, two, three, four. I, I, I saw you before I joined in October, and coming weeks was like four weeks then, and it's it'll, been it'll 12. Be next, it'll be next two, three weeks. Two, three weeks. It, the, the, the draft is complete. It, it's going through its editing process. Okay. Yes. Very good. So maybe if that's the case, and you're willing to say that, like you said, um, so maybe in two or three weeks, if we do not have something, or we all don't have something, because we're not getting it before the community, so if, if something's not ready for presentation purposes or reporting purposes, then you need to know to come back. Like, this is this is the invitation. Yeah. So if, if we don't have a report, we're gonna need to see you back, because the community thinks that, you know, we're stalling this, or, I mean, there's a lot of um, misperceptions out there about our involvement and our stalling, and that's that's been quite opposite. We've done everything that we can to encourage this. We've been interviewed ourselves. We've, so, um, but th it's time for it to get done. And so yeah. um, the expectations were set with our former president. <clears throat> there was never really a timeline put in place. There should have been. And so now we're really just trying to kind of close in on what was promised. Absolutely. Very good. Anybody else? Thank you, Brad. Appreciate you coming tonight, and look forward to hearing from you in two to three weeks. Thank you. Thank you. give you a couple more minutes we're going to move to public comment right now we're going to move that up because we have some other agenda items we want to do that now No, you because everybody's been here it's probably a little longer than what we had anticipated other presentations going so we want to move that up now it's already 10 o'clock um, so we're going to go into that now and I'll allow for the next couple minutes if you want to turn something in you can more more than happy to do that We're going to go just like last time, Shirley Tomzak. I'm going to pass over to you. Okay. Okay. Um, no. No. Okay. 
Angie Reed. I don't know how I'm going to follow that. Uh, my situation is far more personal and more high school local. Um, so first of all, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I know the last portion is usually reserved for comments, but mine is more question related tonight. Um, I apologize in advance for reading, but I am a far better writer than I am an impromptu speaker, so I wrote it down. Okay, um, in order to arrive at the questions I have, and the reason behind my speaking tonight, I need to give the board some insight into my own personal story. My name is Angie Reed. I'm a 20 plus year Oxford resident. I have two daughters, 2020 Oxford grads, and a son who's a senior. I've been working as a substitute in the Oxford district for more than five years, which has allowed me the incredible opportunity to meet thousands of these kids, literally. I love them. Uh, I am the JV tennis coach, and I am also a certified mid-Michigan therapy dog handler. I worked through the pandemic, even taking on a long-term position. But most importantly, and of note, I was right alongside our students on November 30th. Uh, after the events that shook our community, I began taking my then 10-week-old puppy, Dolly, to the Legacy Center, which all of you know served as our safe haven for the community. It was during that time that I decided to certify Dolly as a therapy dog. Dolly literally loves everybody. I am proud to report that Dolly was a member of the Fall 22 Mid-Michigan Therapy Dog graduating class. After Dolly's graduation in October, she immediately began coming to school with me every Monday at lunch. When I was hired this year as a full-time building sub, which by the way, again, I love these kids, love my job. Every day I am both challenged and entertained thoroughly. Uh, I took Mondays off every week with the explicit plan to bring Dolly to school with me at lunch and volunteer. Fast forward to March 13th. After visiting at lunch, my usual Monday, I got a call from Laura Azoni, the high school recovery coordinator, informing me that Dolly and I were no longer welcome. To be honest with you, after I hung up that day, I literally felt sick. I could not imagine having to tell the kids that Dolly would no longer be coming to see him at lunch. There are a lot of kids at that school, I will tell you, regardless of November 30th, that not only thrive, but count on that interaction, not only from Dolly, but the other dogs at the school. I was asked to discontinue my weekly visits, I was informed, because there are policies and procedures in place, as well as the fact that the OPAC dogs and the mid-Michigan dogs receive different training. Okay. I wonder if the board might be able to direct me to where I can find a copy of that policy and procedure that won't allow me to bring Dolly on Mondays at lunch to volunteer. Regarding the difference in training, I would like to point out to the board that in the past six months that we've been coming on Mondays, we have yet to come into contact with any of the Oxford High School dogs. A fact that can be substantiated by Mrs. Zoni herself because she informed me that the OPAC dogs do not come into the cafeteria. Being an employee that spends five days a week at the high school, I am aware that the mid-Michigan therapy dogs have been phased out and replaced by the OPAC dogs. However, I am not just someone wanting to bring my dog to school, as was suggested to me. I am honestly at a, at a loss as to how someone like myself, who works in the building on a daily basis, volunteers their time for an hour and a half on Mondays each week freely can be asked to stay away. Who are we hurting? This seems ridiculous to me, and it doesn't seem like a reasonable decision for our high school students. 
Perhaps this board can help me clearing up an unsubstantiated error, in my opinion, and perhaps give Dolly an honorary title of OPAC Doug. That's all I have. Perfect, Perfect timing. timing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, oh, you she will, Dr. Markovich will reach back out to you. Thank you. Emily Bush. Good evening. Thanks for allowing me to speak in front of the board this evening. Um, I'm just, I gathered a few questions during the Honor um, Community Health Clinic that I just wanted to ask. I know that they won't necessarily be addressed, but on the record, maybe they can be addressed. Um, mm -hmm. Just a few. Um, do we have a school nurse anywhere in the district? Um, and I know that it was mentioned a few times. What percent of our district students are on free and reduced lunch? I don't know if that's something that we can address, or I'm curious about that. And just I guess a rhetorical question. Haven't some of the complaints been we didn't have the appropriate mental health response on November 30th, 2021? And this is a question I, I don't really, I know sort of, but I would like it addressed. Are guidance counselors, FSLs, and restorative practice staff credentialed mental health providers? And the last question I have is, are we confident as a community that when children leave our buildings, they all have access to quality, affordable mental health care? I guess that's the second to the last. And I think we need to ask ourselves, does the district have an obligation based on what happened here on November 30th, 2021, to partner with a respected evidence-based entity that can provide these types of services? So those are just the questions that I developed during the presentation. Um, so I'm here today in support of the Honor Community Health School-based health clinic or center. To begin, I'd like to start by stating their mission, which can be found on their website. To provide for the health and wellness needs of the underserved of Oakland County through the provision of comprehensive, integrated primary behavioral health and dental care. We have students and families in our school district and community that take advantage of our free and reduced meals. I don't think it's a stretch to assume that many of these same families and students may not have access to affordable quality mental, dental, and mental health care. In a district full of families and kids who have been impacted by our school tragedy, we must take any and every opportunity to facilitate access to such critical services. We are so fortunate to have honor willing and able to step up. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of this incredible center. Not everyone in our community has afforded the luxury of access to the vital services Honor provides. Thank you. Marcy Benzman. All right, that's our unscheduled audience participation. So thanks for allowing us to move that around. Um, we had a lot of little marks on here. We're at a second reading of policy updates. Uh, item E, second reading. Um, we've kind of gone over all these before, what the changes were, what the nuances were. So I, if, if everybody's comfortable and nobody has an objection, we want to just read through them, and then we can either yay or nay them. Yes, absolutely. Okay. okay. And we we did table the one that there was. Yes. So that, that so we have this, this a lengthy here legal. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's this, not that's not included in this. No. So I right. double checked it. Yep. Correct. Okay. So Why don't you go ahead and, and read okay. those numbers and sure. and we'll yeah um, we'll move, move forward. To, move to approve the second reading of policies. Uh, 5111, 5113.01, 5113.02, 5120, 5200, 6160, 6400, 6700, and 7440.03.
Okay, is there support? Support. Support Dr. Reese. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Um, item number eight, Mr. Barna. <laughs> Finance and operations. <laughs> Good evening. So we have uh, two items on the agenda under finance. Um, yes. And again, as you can see, uh, the first one is the vehicle for maintenance. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, that's a van, as you can see. Um, kind of a little bit of the history behind this is that we actually uh, received board approval uh, last school year uh, for a Ford uh, van. And uh, that did not come to fruition because of the supply chain crisis. And during that time, um, we ended up canceling the order because they wanted to charge us an additional $10,000 over and above what the board had approved at the time. So this is the alternative and what you have in front of you, which is part of my deal. So it is a consortium priced vehicle. Uh, and that is what you are currently reviewing for the purchase. It is part of budget, uh, part of the general fund, part of Tony Sarkin's maintenance budget. So. Is this a Ford or is it a it's, it's actually a, a Dodge, so. Is that, is this the? This is the first item, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> was this the, because I, I, I was looking at that and I thought we just, didn't we just get a vehicle? Was this the one that the yeah. step, the plow of snow to? So this does not. This is actually okay, a box one. truck. And part of the issue and why we need this van, we already have one in the district, uh, which is being used by one of our maintenance staff. Uh, but currently, one of the other individuals, our maintenance technician, um, drives a, uh, a, a truck. And all the tools uh, that he needs to go around the district uh, do not fit into the truck. And so we're having to have others drive, meet him, give him tools from the big box truck in order to make this all work out. So the truck that is currently being utilized for the tools, uh, some of the tools, uh, will still be kept in fleet. Um, it is a 2016 GMC, um, and it will be uh, have a plow put on front of it. We have an extra plow in the maintenance building to be used for such purposes. So it, it will not be sold. The one so, he's driving? The one he's currently driving, that's right, the 2016 GMC. Okay. okay. And there's no motion on that? No, just wanted okay. you to review it. And okay. if you have any questions, obviously, today or... In the next two weeks, feel free to reach out to Vicki, and uh, obviously uh, I will get the answers to your questions that you have regarding that. All right, very good. And then there's item B, purchase request for the athletic department. That's right. And so this are, these are three mats, uh, wrestling mats, and so this is the purchase, uh, approximately $30,000. Uh, $10,000 of those funds is actually from the boosters, and so I just wanted you uh, <coughs> to... Uh, Look at that, review that. Um, mm -hmm. This is not part of the original budget for athletics, but it's something that's really necessary. And so it'll just be an add to, to our budget for this year. Um, is this gonna be at the high school or the middle school? This is at the high school. Okay, I just wanna be sure. But the middle school's gonna get their old, old mats? That's correct, yeah. So we're, we're gonna repurpose these mats uh, at the middle school. So. so one of the things that I, I, I asked around about is our middle school holds the Oakland County wrestling meet for middle school and it is a big it's a large mm -hmm. event so it's not like we could you know having those mats over there taking them from the high school and moving over there and they're how old are the ones at the high school they're probably five six seven years old yeah, at least yes yep so yes. we could transition those over to the middle school and then have new ones okay. yes i just want to be sure i got i i'm confused i thought that the notes that they were 20 years old. I'm confused they about could, something. It could very well be. That's, well, yeah. I think they said well, those would be destroyed. Then there was a second set. Yeah. There's a, so there's oh, okay. a really old deteriorated set. There's ones, there's ones that, that are. Destroyed. Well, really and then the second set that the high school has will go to middle, middle school. school. And then, and the then brand new ones are them. going to high school. Is that so correct? The, I read it. High school has two sets of wrestling mats. Correct. But they only use one set at a time? For, mat, for, for competition. They have the wrestling room yeah. that practice they practice in. I think those are the ones that are 20 plus years old. Right, because I remember when this one came to the Boosters Club, I was at that Boosters meeting, and that was a while ago. Um, and we had, and there was a lot of discussion about the 
um, condition those mats were in. So I'm surprised that it's that it's taken this long to get this far. But um, we're pretty frugal. Because um, <laughs> what's that? We're pretty frugal. So yeah. We try to be. Well, uh, and I don't remember what, and I don't remember what. Um, the boosters, I, I mean, obviously the booster says you have to contribute, because that's what they do, that's what the Boosters Club does, is they will help donate money, but they don't just give we are money, right. you have to contribute. Right. We're very grateful for their donation to yeah. us, obviously. So. Um, so, so we have, so then that will leave us one set at the high school. No, maybe two sets. Two sets. Two sets. So, okay. So, okay, there's two sets now. <laughs> right. One's old. Yeah, and it has to go in the trash. Years. Like old, 20 years right, old. Right, like. And one's like right. five or six years old. Right. So, the high school's going to get rid of the old one. The 20 year one's going right. to go in the garbage can. Right. They're going to get a brand new one right. with this money. Right. And then they're going to give that five or six year old one over to the middle school. I, th I think. I think Am I right. You know, so that's where I'm still lost. If it's, if it's critical right. for yeah. the decision, you can hold the decision, and I'll get you the answer. If it's not critical for the decision, you can let us buy the mats, and I will still get you the answer. Right. Because I don't. I at this point, I'm confused, <laughs> and I thought I knew. Well, but maybe yeah, I, but I am too confused. I, I don't know, Mary. We could clarify uh, these questions for you. Yeah. I don't. Know. I, I mean, I whether we have two sets or three sets. And one's great, and one's. I mean, I, you're right. We are some. We are somewhat frugal when it comes to spending general funds. The booster club does contribute a significant amount of money. They sure do. And I, this one thing I do know about the booster club is there are so many people asking for money. They just don't give it to you just on a whim. And, and uh, so I feel somewhat comfortable saying that. They vetted a lot of this out. Oh, and I know, and I know that they're needed. Um, I, I just would. Is there a reason we are doing it right now? Well, they would Without. like to. They would like to get them in sooner rather than later because of something to do with the season. But okay. Um, to be to be honest with you, uh, I thought it was just kind of this automatic thing that that wouldn't require a lot of questions, and I may be wrong on there. And if necessary, we can move it to the 25th, and I can get you the answers you need. I don't, I mean, I don't think I have to have the answers to move it. I just don't like having, I, I, I would just prefer the process worked as it was can I, supposed to. Can I just read you Tony's response? Yes, would that thank be you. helpful? Yes. Yeah. Verbatim. The middle school will receive mats that are almost identical to those being ordered. Ordered, excuse me. They are currently housed in the high school, but the plan is to transfer the existing mats to the middle school. These mats are three years old, and the higher quality refers to their condition, weight, ability to clean, ability to store, and ability to, to maneuver. The mats that the middle school currently uses will be sold, given away, or discarded. Does that clear it up for you at all? Uh, no, but that's okay. <laughs> I, I did read that. I'm still not sure where the, all these mats are. Um, I think at the end of the day, we have a really strong wrestling program, and if we have booster funds money, as Dan said, I'm comfortable making a motion to move this forward in this meeting. We have a lot of decisions to make in the next meeting as well. Correct. Yes. All right, so if you're comfortable making the motion, and you want to make the motion. I will. And it's supported. Mike's got something. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I said I'll talk oh. it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So go oh. ahead and make go ahead and make your motion. Then we can have this in discussion, and then we okay. can vote on it. And if it we don't moves, have to vote seven out. Yes. Move exactly. to approve the purchase of wrestling mats from X Flex in the amount of thirty thousand dollars as presented. Is there support, Mike? Discussion. I think we've already had some, but is there any further? Well, I just I guess my I guess my point of discussion is that there that we got the information on Thursday in the agenda packet and. Um, the request was for us to vote on it right away, and we're really we're working hard to not get in that pattern. So let's not get in the pattern of voting on things right away. That's. I apologize. I thought that we did it. I, I thought either was allowable depending on the circumstance, and if the board and and so if if the board wants it to always be presentation vote presentation vote. I can make sure that that's what happens. I just didn't think that was a directive because of the way other things have come before you in the past. 
but I'm, you know, three months on the job. I'm right. really wrong. Right, right. Uh, well, and I know that they've been needing these mats for a long time. I'm just, I'm trying, I'm, I'm sorry to make this into a big thing. I just don't want it. I don't want to get in the habit. Pattern. Right, I don't want to create a habit because we got to a point where we were, before you were here, Vicki, we, that we were doing that. That it always seemed to be like, we got to vote on something right away, and we got to vote on this right away. And we're working really hard to not have to do that unless there's a, you know, unless there's, um, you know, unless, uh, unless, unless there's, there's a, a technology issue right, where we need to get something Right, there's a reason we now. can either get it, the price or something, so yeah. it's I, fine. I, That's all I got. I don't I, 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 I appreciate the, the due diligence. It's more about the process. Right, yeah. and I appreciate the, the thought towards the process. And I think if, if we're going to take a takeaway here, that would be the way that we would prefer to see it in the okay. future. Okay. Is that good? Yeah, let's vote accordingly right. then and press on. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Comment? Yeah. That's scheduled public comment. <clears throat> and now we're on item 11, scheduled activities. We have a Board of Education meeting on the 25th. Oh, let's not go through them. They're right no, here. I know. I know, but I'm just, I just want to point out. 1025. I know. I want to point out the Board of Education meeting so people don't. So it's the 25th, May 9th, and May 23rd, and June 13th and 27th. All right? Any clarification, Vicki? No. Final board comments, anybody? May 4th, OCB. That's the government relations thing. I'll be there, but if there's others that want to join me, let me okay. know. Yeah. Uh, anybody else? As I talk to legislators, yeah. Okay. Um, we have a closed session. Make a motion, please. I'll do it. Go ahead. Move to meet in closed session pursuant to Open Meetings Act section, section 8K to consider security planning to address the existing threats or prevent potential threats to the safety of students and staff. Is there support? Support, support James. Any discussion? Roll call vote, please. Trustee Whitney? Yes. Trustee Summers? Yes. Trustee McDonough? Yes. Secretary Reese? Yes. Treasurer Hanser? Yes. Vice President Schaefer? Mm, yes. President <laughs> D'Alessandro? Yes. Okay, we're going to closed session. 1024. 1024.
Uh, but all right, we are back in open session at 11:24. Um, meeting is adjourned.